and gentlemen, prepare for a thrill. We have stories of the dead coming back to life to tell of the downright evil. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. The All American Hello and welcome to another edition of the All-American Spook Show Podcast. I'm Josh, and I'm once again joined by Will and the Professor Smoke. What's up, everybody? And today we debate whether sometimes dead is better. That, of course, means we're going to be watching one of two pet cemeteries. We've decided to watch the 1989 original that came out 30 years ago this year. Actually, almost to the day. It was released uh, April 21st, 1989. Yeah, it's uh, very well timed with the uh, with the new one. Just as we're recording this, um, the new one, the new Pet Cemetery, to, uh, just came out. To the 2019 version just came out uh, yesterday, right? April 5th. Yep. Um, so a lot of you uh, may have went out to the theaters this past weekend and uh, checked that out. Um, I wasn't able to go see it yet. Uh, Neither was Will, but Smoke, you went and saw it, so uh, I guess, you know, I'm sure we'll get to it a little bit further down the road, but just give us your initial reactions to it now that you've seen it. Uh, yeah, that, I, overall, I enjoyed it. I thought, uh, you know, they, they made some changes from the from the movie and also, I assume, from the book, because I've read the book, but it's been since probably the late mid to late 80s. Actually, I think right before the original Pet came out was, what, was when I read the book. Now, what so you, my what, recollection of that's a little foggy. But what was that? Go ahead, John. We'll, we'll, go, we'll go into this, obviously, here as we go along in the show today. But uh, what you see, at least in my opinion, in the 1989 version of Pet Cemetery is, you know, just an abbreviated version of what the book is. It's very, it's pretty true to it. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things they left out. And, of course, they can't go as deep as they do in a book. But, right. um... It's what you see in the 1989 version is pretty true with the book. So, what they, you know, just based on that, now that you've watched both here recently, you can, I mean, whatever differences you saw in the new one from this movie are probably much different from the book as well. Yeah, yeah, they, they did. Of course, I, I'm not gonna, I won't give anything away, of course, now that if you watch the trailer, though, the trailer gives away <laughs> probably more than it should. Yeah, yeah. But there's a certain key scene in there that it is different. And, uh, Two others probably near the end too, where it was changed up a bit. But uh, overall, I enjoyed it. Uh, I thought the atmosphere was good. It, it uh, I'm sure it, you know, the creepy the music and everything. I'm sure enjoyed they had all to, that. All of that kind of work. Uh, go ahead. I'm sure they had to have up the gore factor in this one, right? In the new one. Yeah, yeah maybe a little. Actually, I mean, maybe a little bit. It might have been a little bit gory, but not, not overly so. Yeah. I guess is a, uh, is. Pascal, oh, Pascal, that character is still in there. Mm-hmm. Actually, his might have been a little bit more restrained. Yeah, his uh, his makeup in the new movie versus the one in the the original one. You know, with his, I mean, there was still a, kind of a scene of his of the brain exposed a little bit, but but the one in the nineteen eighty nine version was actually pretty, you know, it was pretty splattery. I think. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, uh, Which you I know, think they might maybe were a little bit more restrained with him in the new movie, but uh, other scenes too. Yeah, that that were. Which of course, you, you know, Judd, you got Judd and his his demise, I mean, as it is in the movie, as it is in the book, mm-hmm. you know what's going to happen to him. Yeah, yeah. I think that was maybe actually a little bit more graphic overall in the original 1989 movie. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to get too far into that since, you know, yeah. yep. we'll, we'll get there somewhere down the road. But oh, yeah, yeah, hopefully if anybody's out, you know, listening today, what we do here is we do a spoiler field discussion review of a movie, you know, we, we pick a, a particular movie, you know, in general to talk about. And we, when we, when we go into a pretty deep dive on it and we do give spoilers. So if you haven't watched the original, um, 1989 pet cemetery or, or, you know, since this is episode nine, any of our other previous eight episodes, you know, you probably want to make sure before you listen to it to go watch the movie because we're going to spoil the hell out of it. Um, you know, and then we give our ratings of what we thought about the movie at the end um, so that's a little bit about us, you know, we, we basically just talk about horror movies, cult movies, you know, and we sprinkle in some TV shows, you know, we'll, we'll randomly talk about some other things too, but each episode is generally devoted to one movie. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, uh, you can email us, um, at allamericanspookshow at gmail.com. Um, we are at AA Spook Show on Twitter. Um, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube by searching All American Spook Show, and uh, we do have a uh, T Public 
page where you know you can go and buy an All American Spook Show logo T shirt. Um, good Lord, what else do they sell? Mugs, pillows, whatever they can, whatever pretty much they provide. They slap the logo on there. You can buy it there. So if you want to support the show, buy a T shirt. You can go over on tpublic.com and search for the All American Spook Show. So uh, I guess with that being said, uh, Will, what have you been uh, up to lately? You been watching anything new? Any TV movies? Anything you want to talk about? Uh, I think I finally finished up uh, The Runaways. Uh, just watched Tag. About half of Night School, but I wasn't able to finish it because the DVD started scratching up. Thanks, Redbox. <laughs> <laughs> that's that. I mean, honestly, that's about it. I'm kind of up to date with Flash, except for the most recent episode. Uh, but yeah, that's about it. Smoke, how about you? Anything new? Obviously, you just went and saw uh, the you went and saw the new Pet Cemetery and uh, yep. And uh, anything else at the theaters or DVDs, VHS, whatever lately? Uh, saw us as well. A couple, another you know the week before, uh, and I really like to get out, but I was actually a little little let down by us. Just, uh, so, so this is the second personally. the second movie directed by uh, Jordan Peele from. Uh, that most people would know from Key and Peele, the old Comedy Central show. Yeah. Who would have thought that that dude becomes like the uh, <laughs> the new one of the new horror masters between Get Out, <laughs> right. Us, and now he's producing uh, and starring in uh, the Twilight Zone remake. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. A reboot, however you want to put it, on uh, CBS All Access. So who would have thought that dude? Is that... <laughs> I haven't got to see the YouTube release of the first episode. Was that on YouTube? Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if it's still up there, but I, I believe, like, uh, uh, at least uh, earlier this week, the first week of April, um, the, yeah, they had put the first episode up on YouTube, and I believe I shared it to the uh, our Facebook page. So if it's still yeah, available. Did you get to watch it? I haven't got to watch it yet. I, no, I was busy watching other stuff this week, and I didn't get a chance to watch it. Yeah, me either. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I've heard the little bit that I've heard about it. I've heard good things, so. And, and I've heard there's a lot of Easter eggs, at least especially in the first episode of, you know, the old series. So if you're a fan of the original Twilight Zone series, I, I'm sure there's, you know, callbacks and Easter eggs and shout outs, blah, 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 and that. So I'm sure there'll be things you'll recognize from that, from what I understand. So what did you think of uh, Us, Smoke? I thought uh, the acting was great. Yeah. Uh, Storyline was all right, but it's just, uh, it was, I predicted one of the things that was going to happen and ended up being that way. So I was like, well, damn, <laughs> usually, you know, you don't necessarily see all that that was coming. Like you can get out for instance. Uh, mm -hmm. And also the a little heavy handed, maybe in the, in the metaphor and symbolism and just throwing everything into the pie, so to speak, that, uh, so much to keep up with. And, and a lot of things that you like that I would probably have to go back and look at outside of the movie yep. to get, that that's one thing that I heard from another guy that I know that uh, I asked him, he went and saw it and I asked him about it. And he said that uh, kind of sounded like, you know, what you just said, except he said that the ending, it, it's it's almost like a movie you need to go see again to kind of fill in right. some of the blanks. Yeah. And I'm sure I will end up getting around to, see it, to watching the second time after it's done with the theatrical run and everything. So. I'm sure you will. And then you'll buy the Blu-ray. And if uh, somebody makes a VHS, uh, <laughs> bootleg or something of it you'll buy that and <laughs> <laughs> i've seen it that apparently that's Did becoming it? like a thing now like for people to like make vhs versions of new movies like they they actually oh, yeah. they actually dumb them down like they'll take a blu-ray oh, yeah. or a dvd or whatever and then like dumb oh, it down to a down vhs yeah and, like, <laughs> yeah and put it yeah like you know you'll have generational loss obviously and then like put it yeah. in four three aspect and then, like, you know, put it on a VHS, so I guess you're getting that uh, uh, VHS experience with it. Yeah, there's actually a lot of, I, and I know there's been some companies that are doing not even necessarily that degeneration of it, but just releasing independent horror movies on VHS. Yeah, I have seen a few of those. On down the road, you know. Like one of those Hatchet movies, Victor Crowley, I think was released on, as a, oh, yeah. on a VHS by some company. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I used to, they used to do it as limited editions, well, because... You can go back to, I, remember, I even remember what the last official VHS release was, uh, was The History of Violence. That, mm -hmm. that film, that Cronenberg uh, film. Oh, you mean that was one of the last ones that was that actually was yeah, released was, like DVD and VHS? 
yeah, that was the last official VHS. I mean, you know, other things came out independently, but as far as wide release VHS by a major yeah, film a company. VHS. Yep. Yeah. Huh. But yeah, that's that, a good one some, there. I've, what's that? I said that's a that's a hell of a movie right there, History yeah, of Violence. That's it's, good. it's been a while since I watched it, but I, I remember liking that. Yeah, that was that was that was a great one. I thought, and uh, actually, I think I haven't even looked it up myself, but apparently that VHS. I'd heard was going for a decent amount. I mean, not like any crazy amount of money, but it was going for more than an average VHS from the 2000s would. And more, I think simply because it's the last, it was the last VHS release, official release. More than the two or three dollars that you should spend on a fucking yeah. VHS. <laughs> right. Look, I get just the I, look. I get the nostalgia fact. thing, and I know you're big into like buying VHS and stuff like that. But it, to say that that's better quality than what you're getting now. Oh yeah, no. Nah. I mean, and maybe nah. that's not what people say, you know, obviously, but I'm, I'm sure there's somebody out there that's like, no, man, you know, that's the way to do it. <laughs> but I don't. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's yeah, a reason, got, you know, some, everybody. There's some digital on. people that would say that it's, it's, you know, it's kind of like vinyl. Like people say, well, vinyl, you know, it sounds better than there. There is some argument there, of course, with analog and the warmth of vinyl and the audio and everything. But, yeah. Well, I could see that. But you can't say, yeah, you can't do it the other way around. You can't say VHS is better than, you know, better image quality. It's just that it's like, for instance, you could take. I mean, I buy, I still buy VHS, but I don't pay crazy prices. I won't go on eBay and like spend fifty dollars on a tape if I can find it in the wild, at, you know, a thrift yeah, well, store. Or yeah, that's one thing. Like if you're that, going, if you're going to the Salvation Army or something, and you paid a dollar for it or two, right? Yeah. Okay, you and know. I found quite a few things like that, like that I could, if I so chose to put it on eBay, could turn it around and sell it for forty or fifty bucks or yeah, whatever. I don't doubt it. I, I, I like finding them that way, you know, out in the wild rather than just plucking down because it, it got to a point where there's so many people that get into it as a trend that it drives the prices of these movies up as I, as I remember when dvd was coming out i used to buy a lot of tapes then because a lot of people were selling them on ebay at that time for like two or three or four bucks you know so i guess it wasn't so in demand or so it hadn't become a, a, like the trend i guess hadn't been there yet to I drive guess, the price up even further so i guess everything's cyclical you know the, the retro yeah. stuff i get it you know but even recently, yeah. it seems like there's a little bit of like uh, people wanting to buy like cassette tapes, you know, albums on cassette tapes. I'm like, all right, now you done lost your oh, mind. Yeah. Like, it's one thing to have the nostalgia of it, like, hey, I got a bunch of cassette tapes sitting around, but you're crazy if you think uh, what you're hearing <laughs> on that cassette tape is better than what you're on the CD or, uh, <laughs> hell, even these days, streaming uh, audio on, uh, I don't know, Spotify or, you know, any of these other ones. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. the quality is going to be better, more than likely, than anything you listen to on a cassette. There's a yeah, reason. See, there's a reason the eight tracks and cassettes and everything died. Just remember that, folks. Yeah. I guess I can see certain aspects of not being better, but in the, well, the way the VHS, let's say, let's say you take a movie like, like Maniac or Last House on the Left or any of those types of grindhouse movies, where the nostalgia factor is somewhat plays into it, but it's, it's the fact of seeing it when you were watching probably a grainy 35 millimeter transfer to begin with that got put on that VHS. And then it's been watched by two, three, four, five hundred people. Yeah. Degrading it more. So when you finally see those scenes from Texas Chainsaw or Last House, it has that patina of grime and stuff in there that, that you kind of, it, it, it basically kind of masks the effects too, to some degree, It kind of yeah. helps the effects become more gruesome or more splatter. You know, they, you don't see the zipper in the suit, so to speak, you know, yeah. <laughs> because of the high def, like 4K scan. You know where? Oh, okay, yeah. Now I see. Yeah, yeah, true. How I mean, especially on an older one. Yeah, or, yeah, I get that. Yeah. Or like, so I know, think that plays into a little bit of it when when it comes to old movies, anyways, on VHS. Plus, too, you know, like I have a, a younger uh, uh, brother and sister-in-law. You know, they're they're only now in their early twenties, so like they barely remember a time when, you know, VHS was the way you watch movies. Oh. You know, they really don't remember yeah. it, obviously, you know, and if they do, it's barely, right? Yeah. So I think there's a little bit of that millennial uh, retro, uh, I, I don't know what the word is, you know, just kind of just kind of scratching for a time that they didn't, ha they didn't, they really have little to no knowledge yeah. of, you know. True. The yep. throwback thing, you know. Yeah. I mean, look. Kind of going back to the original point of, uh, like this being like a, I guess a little bit more expensive on uh, purchasing it, purchasing it like secondhand uh, on eBay. It's like going for about sixty to seventy-five bucks. Uh, oh. History of Violence. Wow. Oh, is it? Wow. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> That's like nineteen eighty-seven uh, VHS prices. 
you know, when you had to buy one from the store, you know, that we've talked about before. So. Yeah. And I do have that on tape. Just because, I mean, I also have it on DVD as well. I have it on tape simply because, I and mean, I did, of course, pay that if I found, well, I think I bought it when it came out or shortly after or got it somewhere for like, you know, cheap, fairly cheap. But, but I, I kept it on VHS simply because it was the last. <laughs> And I'm Glass sure, related, and I'm sure if you hit your local Goodwill, you could probably find it. Yeah, yeah, you probably could. You know, I if mean, you search long I'm, enough, well, you, you'll find it randomly. Like, unless you have somebody there. Now I don't do this because I, I love finding movies, and if I already have it, I'm going to leave it there. I'm not going to put it on eBay and try and jack somebody's price up. But I'm sure you do have people that are going out there and scouring thrift stores in certain areas if they know about that type of thing. You know, if they know that that movie is yeah. making that, they're going to go scour it and put it on there. And, yeah, I remember hearing I remember hearing that a few <laughs> a few years ago about like the old Disney VHS, the Black Diamond series. Oh yeah, yeah. Where there were people going nuts because like the Beauty and the Beast or Little Mermaid or some shit was worth <laughs> hundreds if not thousands of dollars. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know where that exactly started. That kind of started as a rumor and then just people went crazy. With, I mean, there are there are plenty of Disney VHSs out there that do well, demand those prices, but not like, you know, not like your your average Disney movie from the seventies or eighties or nineties that you could, that would they, you know, put in wide release, like thousands of copies on VHS. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever see the original cover of the little mermaid? Very yeah, actually we had, yeah, we do have that. One too. <laughs> yes. Somebody's a uh, little in joke within the, uh, the little, uh, the <laughs> undersea kingdoms in the background. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or very in your face. <laughs> well, I'm sure something like that. I mean, I can understand something like that being worth something yeah. because I'm sure eventually yep. they called it and pulled it. Right. So whatever's yeah. still out. It's like, it's like finding the old, uh, what is it? 89 Fleer Billy Ripken fuck face card. Yeah. Where the end of his bat says fuck face. But like the one that's worth the money, the most money is apparently like, uh, when some the whiteout, right? Yeah, somebody tried to uh, uh, cover it up with whiteout, and there's like a hundred cards that just have whiteout over the fuck face on the end of his <laughs> oh, back. <laughs> and those are the ones that are worth like hundreds if you can find one. But yeah, oh, wow. but I mean, the point. My point is, is the the scarcity of the scarcity of it, the rarity of it, is what makes it valuable. Yep. Not yeah. just yeah. The, not just the existence of it, you know. So. <laughs> yeah, I think there was. A, I don't know what that was there, but I think some people just went out and. And just did that, at that point, discovered all the thrift stores and everything, found these any diamond classic they could get and put, put it on eBay for this exorbitant price. And yeah. then other people thought that that was really what it was going on, so they did the same thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just because of some random fo uh, Facebook post yeah. that went viral, you know, saying that <laughs> yeah. all these black diamond VHS were thousands. Oh come on, Josh! It was MySpace now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't remember the word that viral in MySpace back then, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I just remember being able to put cool pictures on there and music when you went to my pay, uh, my MySpace page. You know, <laughs> that's why you still got some MySpace page yeah, floating yeah, out there. So we've had a VHS <laughs> rant, a tape cassette rant, and a MySpace rant, mini rant. So there you go. It's a good start, <laughs> folks. And if uh, you know you're listening to us because uh, Pet Cemetery just came out, this is what you'll get every time: random nonsense from three dudes. <laughs> Yes. Um, I also saw where some people refer to this movie as Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. So there, there's kind of two, almost like two working titles for this movie. And you know, going back to the VHS thing, you know, I'm not, I'm not harping on. I mean, I'm not digging on it because I mean, I, I liked, I enjoyed it obviously at the time, and and I still think it's cool. You know, especially like the box art and uh, everything. I just mean like the 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 uh, quality of it isn't the same but oh yeah. yeah but but that being said i mean like we we definitely hear on the uh on the uh, spook show we appreciate those days so i mean like we definitely play into that in our social media you know even the opening to our show you know it's definitely all in, uh, a lot of it is an homage to that time period you know because a lot of people are you know familiar with that and uh you know and and that's all where we grew up that's in our wheelhouse so i mean you You'll get a lot of the VHS feel and the VHS talk and all that stuff on this show. So I'm not ragging on it. I'm just saying that for those people that say that's better quality, you're nuts. <laughs> yeah. um, and I mean, you don't necessarily need, I mean, for me personally, I, I'm collecting a lot of VHS and from back in the day and everything and still now, but I don't need to have, let's say, if there was a version of the new Pet Cemetery put out in VHS, I don't need that. <laughs> I don't need to go backwards that way, you know. Yeah. New yeah. version. I get it on Blu-ray or whatever. Yeah, and that's what and I mean I'll about that, like that that 
reverse downplay thing, whatever yeah, the yeah. whatever the term of it is for. That's that's a little goofy, you know. Like to me, yeah, yeah, that, it's cool. That I get it. That that's a little silly. You're saying like the sort of millennial sort of uh, yeah. what is it uh, throwback type. But it, you know, I'm gonna. But here's the oh, kicker. But, but here's the kicker, though. I guarantee you, they're not charging those old prices. You know, if you oh yeah, they're going to put limited edition. Of, oh yeah, they're going to call it limited edition, or <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's going to be fifty to a hundred dollars just to uh, watch a dumbed down version of uh, you know the new Stephen King's It, you know, <laughs> on a VHS for some reason. <laughs> Which would be totally different than let's say like the one movie I have that I don't even know if it's ever been put on DVD or not. But one thing is you don't need it to be on Blu-ray or 4K or anything is like, say, Gourmet Zombie Chef from Hell. It was shot on VHS, so it should be watched on VHS. Yeah. Or, well, you know, trans- you transfer it to DVD, but you- there's no point in trying to clean something up and having like a high-def, you know, version of Gourmet Zombie Chef from Hell. I just read something about that from um, um, another Stephen King classic, uh, The Stand. There was something mm. I just recently read about how, like, uh, I guess the guy that directed it, produced it, whatever, somebody that has something to do with it, came out and said that, uh, yeah, you'll never see, maybe not never, I mean, you never say never, but you probably will not see a Blu-ray release of The Stand because I think it was basically shot on, uh, you know, like, I think... What, oh, I'm like, it was yeah, six, I got... You. Not 16 millimeter, but, th- you know, something, something where, like, basically it would be extremely expensive to go back and upgrade this thing, you know probably right. not worth their time and effort to do it so you'll probably yeah, never see it, it just on tv too it was TV yeah and it was shot for, yeah it was shot for tv and it was like basically <laughs> you know made to fit the screen and all that kind of stuff so they'd have to do some major work with the original prints just to go back and you know upgrade it or whatever so he's like yeah don't expect that you'll probably never see it but By I the think, way, currently uh it 2017 on vhs is going anywhere between six and ten bucks eh, on vhs <laughs> That's not too bad. I mean, although it's stupid, that's not too bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, see, that's that's not where I'm at with being a you know a fan of VHS and collecting VHS is not necessarily. Now I won't say that I haven't bought some new, not new movies on VHS, but new releases of movies that were on VHS back in those days or shot on video and these under you know independent underground type horror movies that a lot of times didn't even get a DVD release. And actually, that's the other thing too that I think. Is the cool thing about VHS is there's so many movies out there on tape that have never been put on DVD, and probably never will because. Oh yeah, I'm sure there's hundreds, if not thousands, of yeah. movies. Because there's not a big demand for yeah, certain yeah. ones. You know, there's certain ones that have this entertainment value, or especially if you're like a fan of exploitation, underground cult films, and stuff like that. That there's a lot of them that are on DVD, and a lot of them that have been put on Blu-ray, and probably will be in the future. But also, there's just as many or more that probably won't never see the light of day on a DVD or digital release. Yeah. All right, so I guess with all that preamble and VHS randomness uh, being said, I guess let's finally dig into this sucker. 1989's Pet Cemetery. Um, as I said earlier, it was released on April 21st, 1989, so this is coming out you know, almost 30 years to the day that it was released. Um, it's based on a novel by horror icon Stephen King, you know, who's released... Um, Dozens and dozens of uh, best-selling horror books um, over the last, what, 40, 50 years. The dude's been doing it since the late 60s, I think, that, early yeah. 70s. Um, so, yeah, this was based on a novel written by him called Pet Cemetery, And he also did he also did the screenplay for this movie. So that's why this movie, I, I believe, stays fair, you know, very true to the book. Um and that book, his original book, was released in November of 1983. So, what? That's about six, seven years later, something like that, when this movie comes out. Yep. I had read something that said that like uh, George Romero actually had the the original film rights to this movie. Oh yeah, yeah, I do remember something like that back in yeah, back and, then, but and I don't uh, remember why it fell through exactly. Uh, apparently, he cu- he just kind of uh, it didn't work out. Like uh, from what I read, it sounds like. You know, he wanted to do it, but uh, apparently he had to kind of back out because he was doing monkey shines at the time. And uh, and then he ended up picking up Dark Half later, though, and doing that Stephen King adaptation anyways. Yeah, yeah. Um, so apparently, basically, it just kind of it kind of bounced around for a little while after that, after, like, he had to back out. And then Paramount eventually picked it back up in 1988 when they were having a, a writer's strike, a writer's guild uh, strike in Hollywood. 
So basically they picked it up because they were kind of running out of material. They, they didn't think they'd have enough stuff to release in 1989 because of this strike. So it kind of got picked up because it was already done and away to the races. Um, mm-hmm. Also, apparently Stephen King played a big part in, uh, you know, not only getting this done, but like, uh, uh, I think like uh, uh, casting and directing uh, the director and everything like that, too. Like, I think he pretty much um, selected this director. The, uh, Mary Lambert is the lady that direct, uh, directed it. <clears throat> he had a big hand in her being the one that got to direct it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, his fingerprints are all over this, not just in the DNA of the story. You know, the fact that he wrote the story and everything, but he was involved in the uh, movie process as well. And uh, apparently it's also uh, um, based on, like, uh, he wrote the book based on, like, a personal experience. Like, him and his family moved out to somewhere in Maine. The cat, uh, they had a cat that got hit by a truck. And uh, they, they buried it in the local pet cemetery. And apparently his son almost got hit by a truck. So, like, a lot of the things that happened in this book kind of happened to him in real life. And that was his inspiration to write it. So, apparently, he writes the book and then shelves it because he just, he, he him said, said it was it was too frightening and it was dark and, and dour. And he didn't, and he, and, it, and even he didn't believe that things were this bad, you know, <laughs> I guess. So, like, even he's just like, nah, nah, that, this book's too fucked up, you know. And, and then he kind of put it away. And then finally, like, he had to release one more book on his book deal or something like that. And then eventually he kind of like, all right, here you go. And then they released it and it was a big hit. So, Yeah, I think what I read was like his wife went through and read it and told him to release that one. Yeah, I think she's been a big influence on his career too. Uh, I think her name's Tabitha King. Mm-hmm. Who was also a writer, right? Yeah, yeah. She wrote tons of I've never read anything by her, but yeah, I know she uh-huh. is an author too. And his son is as well. The total runtime for this movie is one hour and 43 minutes. Um, from what I could tell, the budget um, was eleven and a half million for this movie, which is quite a bit for a horror movie, I would think. At least in that time, wouldn't you think? Yeah. Um, oh yeah. It opened up, so the budget was eleven and a half million, and opened up opening weekend made twelve million. So they pretty much made their budget back, you know, give or take a few bucks, I'm sure, right there in opening weekend, and it ended up grossing at least in the United States uh, fifty seven. Fifty-seven point four million dollars, which was I would say would be damn good for a horror movie in nineteen eighty-nine. Yeah, I mean, not being able to comp- I don't have comparisons and stuff like that up, but I'd say that's pretty high for a horror movie in, in those days. Um, but there were a lot of horror movies still coming out in eighty-nine as well, too. So I, I don't know what the landscape was at this time. But it's the movie stars Dale Midkiff as Lewis Creed he's he's the dad he's the, basically the main character of the movie this is probably about the only thing you'd know him from you know at least from what i was looking at he's been in a ton of tv movies tv shows a few a handful of other movies but this would probably be the one thing you'd remember him the most from um it also stars Denise Crosby as Rachel Creed um I, Lieutenant she, Yar <laughs> yeah she's been in a handful of things and uh you would probably also remember her from this uh 48 hours and deep impact right. which would make a hell of a uh, porn movie um <laughs> well i was th- oh you were thinking that too huh? <laughs> Not the only one. oh i thought i've already seen that oh okay um I'm sorry i've never heard of this porn what yeah what? Well, that, that's what we need to do. That's that's going to be one of the upcoming shows. We need to do porn what? parody shows. You know, like the Sperminator and. The... <laughs> oh. Just pick just pick a few of your favorites, and we'll just discuss yeah, yeah. these. <laughs> we won't do a deep dive, wink, wink, but uh, we will uh, discuss yeah. multiple. Something will come up. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what will come up? <laughs> uh, it also stars uh, Fred Gwynn, who most of you. Well, he, in this movie, he plays Judd Crandall, the old man that lives across the street. But most of you are probably going to remember him as Herman Munster in The Monsters back in the 60s. <laughs> or and the also of Tony Gwynn. <laughs> no, oh. no, different, different Gwynn family. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, also in the 60s, he was in uh, Car 54, Where Are You? You know, you know oh, yeah. if for whatever reason you don't remember The Monsters, you probably remember him from that. Let's be honest. If you don't remember him from this, you're not going to remember him from that. <laughs> <laughs> but you might definitely remember him from, uh, was it My Cousin Vinny? The yeah. Judge. yeah. That pretty much wraps up his career right there. All those things we just 
everything else in between, not to knock on him, but everything else in between was uh, a little bit lower down the pole. So, yeah, he's the yeah. judge and my cousin Vinny, which I guess you would argue might be, uh, other than Herman Munster's, probably his biggest role, right? You know, most people, I, yeah. I'd say yeah. more people would remember him from that than they would Pet Cemetery, yeah. more than likely. Yeah, definitely more people today are, are our age. I mean, yeah, yeah. our dad might remember him, of course, from other things. But <laughs> Because um, he has been around since uh, I forget how old he was when I know you know was when he made, when he made Pet Cemetery, but I, I know he had passed away shortly after that. Yeah, he died in July of 1993, and uh, I don't have it right here in front of me. Hold, on, I can look it up real quick. But I believe he was uh, in his mid 60s. Yeah, he died oh, okay. July 2nd, 1993, and he was age 66. So that means he was probably give or take, you know, somewhere between 60 and 62 when they made this movie, early 60s. So, um. Definitely missed. I mean, like, you know, 66, I mean, even though he looks a little older in this movie, 66 is a fairly young age, you know. Yeah. Um, he probably looked a little older than he uh, actually was, really, especially in this movie. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, he he was uh, he was the man as Herman Munster and everything. Um, oh, yeah, iconic in that role. Yeah. Um, he died, yep. and it says here he died after a battle with cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer. Mm. And he was just... Eight days shy of turning sixty-seven when he passed. So, yeah, he's he's sorely missed, and you know, no telling. Especially like it's ironic, you know. Is uh, I remember reading something about him that like you know he had kind of been typecast after uh, the monsters for a long Monsters, time. Yeah. He couldn't shake it, you know. And I, and I think he didn't. I don't. Uh, it seems like I, I could be wrong here, and I hope I am. But I think he had kind of hated it for that, you know, for that reason because he he never could really shake it, you know, and he couldn't move on to other things. And then by the time it seems like he finally got that second lease on his career you know toward the end with pet cemetery and uh my cousin Vinny, he died yeah so that's that's ironic but you know unfortunate but and it, happens, it definitely happens with strong you know strong roles like that you know and look at boris karloff yeah with uh with frankenstein and yeah all the old all the like uh lon cheney jr and uh, uh bella lugosi and all that all know, they, they, yeah they just couldn't shake it you know that's just kind of what they were Yep. Yeah, and then a lot of them did yeah. hate it at first, you know, or, or gave into it a little bit later, maybe. But, yeah. But, yeah, they, they hated it at first. The entire was that time what? I'm watching this movie, all I'm thinking is the monsters. Yeah. <laughs> Especially, I mean, like, now he does a damn good job in this movie, though, man. He really does. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. you believe that the Maine dude, the, yeah, you, you, do, you believe that the dude is an old dude from Maine, you know what I mean? Like, he's got it down, yeah. and he plays it well. But there are moments in it where you can hear a little bit of Herman in there. Yeah. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah, and especially at the time that that movie came out, because that was before. No, my wait, cousin, yeah, that was before yeah. my cousin. Vinny. Oh, yeah, that was way before Mike. Yeah, that was the, so the only thing I'd ever years. seen him in and known him from was the monster. When I saw Pet Cemetery. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd say like like he was probably one of the best actors in this movie because uh, oh, yeah. there was there there was a little bit of rough acting in this. Yeah, yeah. As as true to this film is to the book and 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 you know stand true to the story and everything that Stephen King wrote. Yeah, there's some pretty uh, wooden uh, performances in this thing from a couple people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to go too deep, but there's a scene later on in the movie where the, the dad's emotional. Mm -hmm. Boy, <laughs> I did not buy that. <laughs> yeah, which is, as I just mentioned a little while ago, uh, Dale Midkiff, this is probably the only thing you really remember him from. You know, <laughs> surprise, surprise, you know, based on what yeah, you just said. Yeah. Um, but by, by the way, I'm sorry if you're listening to this. Yeah, sorry, Dale Midkiff. Uh, <laughs> you're awesome. Um, it also stars Brad Greenquist as Victor Pascal. You know the uh, the guy that dies fairly early on in the movie, and then um, uh, kind of haunts. Can you just pop yeah, up? <laughs> yeah, kind of haunts them throughout toward the end. Um, which, from my recollection of the book, is this is played up a, a lot more in this movie than it was in the book. Um, oh yeah, yeah. You know what it kind of reminded me of too was, uh, and I don't know if this was because I like I said I, I guess that character was more so in the movie than he was in the book, but it reminded me of American Werewolf in London. The, the character, yeah. you know, the guy in the beginning of the movie that gets killed, and then he kind of comes back to him in visions and everything. Yeah, yeah. And It's kind of comedic like that as well. Yeah. Oh wow, it reminded me of that a little bit. It does kind of become like the comedic uh, levity. A little bit with this yeah. guy, you know, a little bit later on in the movie. Like, at first, it's kind of a creepy part, and then it, then it almost becomes a little comical in some spots. Right. Um, here, I'm here to help you, but just not quick enough. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, on the airplane, when, <laughs> when she's flying back on the plane, and he's, you know, hey, back there, a couple seats back, you know. Yeah. With his brain hanging out in the, in the airplane seat. 
then waving or whatever. Then he helps her get there and is like, "This isn't the end for you, but it's the end for me." But then it's not the end for him. Um, <laughs> yeah. It also stars Miko Hughes as Gage Creed. Now he's the little, uh, you know, supposed to be like two or three years old. I guess hell, he might have been in this movie. He's he's definitely a small kid. Yeah, um, actually, he was two in that movie. <laughs> Cause we, I, I didn't. I thought he was a little bit older than that when he made the movie. You know, just maybe playing a two year old. He may have been like three or four. Yeah, yeah. Just because the way he comes across in that movie is. But uh, met him at a, at a convention not too long ago, and yeah, he was two years old when he when he made that. That, that is extremely impressive. Yeah. <laughs> just the fact that he could talk that well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and and act the way they wanted him to act. You know, I mean, you know. Yeah, well, they're delivering to... the lines like that. With the uh, now, I want to play with you. You know, yeah, just the yeah, way like... he delivered the lines. <laughs> I'm sure they had to work with him quite a bit to get him to act the way they wanted him to act, like pissed or scary or something like that. Yeah. You know, but uh, at that Playful, age, but man, I tell you, you know, what, he, yet or, yeah. between between the direction and whoever edited this and uh, his, you know whatever little performance they could get out of him, he did a damn good job. Um, True. But you also may remember him from Kindergarten Cop. And uh, he was also in uh, Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Um, yep. And I'm sure a handful of other things, but, you know, those are probably the ones you'd remember the most, you know, besides this one. Um, what I'm reading, he was he was between 31 and 33 months old. Wow. That's, that's impressive. <laughs> it really is. After having two kids and, and, and uh, knowing how hard it is to get them, to, you know, to do anything... It's crazy <laughs> that you could get a two-year-old to act in a, a horror movie like this. And be more convincing than some of the other adult actors in the movie. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. No, no doubt about that. <laughs> some spot. It, uh, you know, and there's a handful of other people that star in it. But, yeah, those are the main characters, you know, the ones you would care the most about in this movie. As I mentioned before, it was directed by Mary Lambert, who, from what I could tell, hasn't directed a lot of movies, but she has directed a shitload of music videos. <laughs> like, um, just about every Madonna video ever made. Um, the Go Go's. I mean, a handful of bands, tons, tons of bands, music videos in the eighties and nineties. And she also did Pet Cemetery too, which I'm sure oh, yes. I'm sure we'll get to one of these days here on the yeah. here on the Spook Show. But let's be honest, will we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I also will say I'll add before I continue, we haven't done a really really shitty movie yet. You know, nine episodes in, so <laughs> there there's gonna be one coming sooner or later, like a real a real trash bag. <laughs> We just, mean, going, we just haven't done our ratings. I would say we have. Uh, no, no, we have. Well, that's my personal opinion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Believe me, we can tap. T- I guess it's all it's all relative, right? To this point, it's relative. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Up to <laughs> nine episodes in. Because <laughs> yeah, we could do some real. Now, oh. not to say that those movies that are complete dog turds aren't entertaining as hell as well, you know, in some well, aspects. Fi- I mean, if some you of want to, you'll find it. Boring. Yeah, I mean, if you want to, you can find entertainment in just about anything. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's what we're here for. We're here, here to help you find the entertainment in some of these. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, we haven't watched any real dog turds yet. It's coming. Yeah. <laughs> um, like I said before, this is based on a, a novel by Stephen King, and he also uh, wrote the screenplay, so this is his baby. Um. It was produced, I thought this was pretty interesting, it was produced by Richard P. Rubenstein, who has produced a, a, a host of uh, horror movies. Yeah, and there's the, could have been the Romero connection, because I know he's worked with Romero, I don't know if that was the original connection Romero had with that, with the possibility of directing it, or not, because I know Rubenstein was one of the producers on Dawn of the Dead, Oh yeah, Day of the Dead. Creep here, show I'll, I'll go down. Yeah, I'll go down the list here. I've got it pulled up. He uh, he's produced Martin from 1978, the same year. Dawn of the Dead, uh, Night Riders, uh, Creep Show 1982, Day of the Dead 1985. Uh, he was executive producer uh, on Creep Show two. Um, he was the executive producer, I guess, of pretty much every episode of Tales from the Dark Side. This movie, yeah. this movie, Pet Cemetery, it tells from the dark side of the movie in 1990. Um, he was the executive producer, I guess, of pretty much every episode of the show Monsters, which was kind of like Tales from the Dark Side. Um, yeah. and, and he's definitely got a Stephen King uh, connection there, too, because he was the EP on uh, Golden Years, um, The Stand, The Langoliers, Thinner. So, yeah, this dude is... Uh, deeply steeped in uh horror 
And the uh, Dawn of the Dead remake, too. He was the producer of that. And a handful of other things, too. But, yeah, this guy has had his fingerprints on a lot of the horror that we all know and love. So we have him partially to thank for this, right? Yep. Um, Or to blame. (laughs) No. (laughs) Maybe some episodes of Tales from the Dark Side we can have a discussion about. (laughs) (laughs) Especially monsters, but. Um, oh, monsters! Yeah. Speaking of VHS, yeah, I have some of those episodes yeah. on VHS. <laughs> oh, v- <laughs> you mean when you would uh, buy like uh, here's volume three and it would have like two yeah, fucking yeah. episodes on two it? Episodes? Or yeah, yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. I even got one of the. Well, I mean, I know it's off subject, but uh, Freddy's Nightmares. You remember that show? That TV oh, yeah, show, Freddy's yeah. Nightmares. Yeah. Yeah. The one that have the the uh, the talk show episode, I think, where he was on a talk show. What about Friday the Thirteenth, <laughs> the series that had nothing to do with uh, Jason? Actually, yeah, I, I bought that whole CV series on DVD. Too, oh, okay. Well, that's actually, nice. once I got over the fact back then that Jason wasn't going to be in the yeah. series, I'm like, I'm like, what is this garbage? I'm not going to watch it. And then when I actually watched I'm like, this is pretty decent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Richard P. Rubenstein, uh, we love your work. Um, and on, so the nitty gritty before we get into the uh, the blow by blow, uh on IMDb, this got 6.6 stars out of 10, so that's not too bad. That's over 60% of the of folks voting liked it. On Rotten, I think that's more than what the remake has right now, or if if just barely, because last time I checked, I think the remake had 6.4. We'll leave. Wow, could have um, changed though. Yeah, you know, because yeah, I mean, yeah, it yeah. just came out. So <laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta be a little fair on those and give them a little give it a little time. You know, it just came out. Yeah, the masses are just now seeing it, so. Yeah. Uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, it got a 50% on the tomato meter, and uh, the audience score was 59%. So the audience loved this one a little bit more than the critics did. But 50% is not a horrible score on Rotten Tomatoes, especially for a horror movie. You'll find you you can find a lot that are far you know rated far less. So that's not too bad. And that's yeah, according uh, according to the internet right now, IMDb is 6.4 on the new Pet Cemetery and 61% oh. on Rotten Tomatoes. For the new pet cemetery. Yeah. Well, you know, Rotten Tomatoes is generally, like as far as the tomato meter, is generally not very uh, friendly to horror. <laughs> you know, so. Take yeah, it, if you care take about it. Roger Ebert, he gives it a 1.4. 1.5 out of 4. Boo! But Roger Ebert it's a, is a weird character, too, when it comes to horror movies, because he will praise, he plays the hell out of the original Dawn of the Dead. And, of course, you know, and then condemn something that's very similar to Dawn of the Dead, but... <laughs> Yeah, but totally condemn it, you know. So, like I was, it was always. I mean, I, yeah, I respected the uh, Siskel and Ebert reviews on uh, back in the day on certain movies and all that stuff. But when it came to horror movies, I'm like, what? I don't get that. I don't get this sometimes. Well, no, that, that gets this much, and then you know, whatever. To be fair to him, that's out of his wheelhouse. You know what I mean? Like, true. Yeah, yeah. he's probably someone that would admit that you know he's not a big fan of this stuff. So, people <laughs> like that, you know, you take it for what it's worth. You know? Oh yeah. <laughs> At this point, like I, th- I feel like everything should be in his wheelhouse, <laughs> like this far in. Well, he's dead. Well, one thing that's definitely dead not now, in his wheelhouse so. was uh, was Silent Night, Deadly Night. You remember that? Oh god! <laughs> Boy, they hated that movie. Like, yeah, I on. bet. Oh, I've heard them. I've heard them. Uh, like uh, I heard them back in the past throw some hate on a lot of movies that we we all oh, yeah. love. So yeah, that doesn't surprise yeah. me. Of course, you know, oh, I yeah. spit on your grave. They're not going to be too kind to it, but not too many critics would be <laughs> to the original I spit on your grave. Oh, God, no. What? <laughs> I spit on your grave. Yeah, they actually had that. I mean, That's, I don't know if they reviewed it on I'm the show. I'm surprised they I'm even really watched like... it. <laughs> yeah, not, not, none too kind to that one. I Will, mean, with good reason. I mean, yeah. Will, you've never seen that one, have you? No. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, we, we got to yeah, throw we got to throw that one in the old. I, I'm sorry. I remember when the original came out, and no, uh, no, you don't. We had uh, we were able to watch <laughs> like stuff on pay per view for a very nice price. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, I never got around to watching that. Of yeah, course, you... I was a kid at the time, so <laughs> probably for the best. Then, what, what age was that? Oh Lord, are you talking about? I, are you talking about? I spit on your grave. Yeah. Now the original came out uh, a little before you were born. That came out in seventy eight. Like, seventy eight, and that's the one that I'm talking about. Now there was a remake. Oh, okay. There was a remake. Yeah, there was a remake. I don't remember what year yeah. that was. I hadn't yeah, even actually I'm seen. I'm thinking the... about in the in the like early nineties, somewhere in there. 
he must maybe be, late eighties. Yeah, you must be thinking of something else because I think the re, the remake just came out like in the last ten years. Yeah, you something. must have been thinking of something else because believe me, the one we're talking about, you'd remember it. <laughs> yeah, and definitely if you saw it as a kid, you'd probably be scarred. If you saw it as oh. like you know a six or seven year old, <laughs> good lord. <laughs> That, the social services might come and take your kid away. I know I keep going back to getting off topic and everything and all that, but I do remember that was one of the covers. I do remember as a kid in the video store wanting to pick up, like, what is this? You know, <laughs> and, <laughs> and then finally getting, to, you know, watching it later on as a teenager or whatever. And then, like I said, social services came knocking and took you, <laughs> took you away. Yeah. <laughs> God, yeah, we we need to put throw that one in the old v, uh, VCR here shortly, man. That one, oh holy, yeah, holy hell, <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, they they definitely up the revenge factor in that one. Like you are yeah. ready for it to come whenever it comes to the, to the people in the movie, you know. Yikes. <laughs> um. Yeah, I guess I am. I could have swore that was one of them, though. Yeah, I mean, like I wouldn't think that would have been playing on uh, anybody's radar by the late '80s or so when you pro- you know the time frame you're talking about. Yeah. But apparently in 2019, I Spit on Your Grave, Deja Vu came out, which is a sequel. Yeah, yeah they've made a few sequels to that now, like to that to the remake. Yeah. I've heard. I mean, I've heard that the remake wasn't too bad, and the people, a lot of people do like the remake. But I, I haven't, haven't got seen, around to watch it. I haven't seen it. My brother uh, bought it and uh, has seen it and said it's pretty good, but I haven't actually sat down and watched it yet. Um, I mean, I know it's not as grueling as... I mean, stuff, of course, it's going to be the same sort of theme, but I know <laughs> that they didn't do quite as much as they did to her in the original movie. It's probably one of the rare occasions Fine. where uh, the remake is going to be less gory than the original, probably, more yeah. than likely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm always wondering if they came out with, like, maybe, like, a 10-year anniversary or something of that, because I could have swore I seen, like, previews of that on pay-per-view. They might, they might have. <laughs> Cause, right, because then when it got put on DVD and stuff, too, like, I know that's back in the Anchor Bay days. I think they were the first company, maybe, that put it out on DVD. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think. I believe I can't remember. It, look, it's a possibility. I ain't going to rule it out, but you might be thinking of something else. I don't know. But maybe maybe it'll all come back, flooding back to you when we watch it one day. Yeah. I wasn't thinking Oh, you were talking this. about back in the late 80s, Will? Back before? Or before DVDs and everything? Uh, you would have watched it on satellites, what you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe. That's a possibility. I don't know. Yeah. Um, oh, well, moving on. Moving on. Back to Pet Cemetery. <laughs> um, so I'll read the uh, uh, Rotten Tomatoes synopsis for this movie before we get into it. Dr. Lewis Creed, played by Dale Midkiff, moves his family to Maine, where he meets a friendly local n- named Judd Crandall, played by Fred Gwynn. After the Creed's cat is accidentally killed, Crandall advises Lewis to bury it in the ground near the old pet cemetery. The cat returns to life. Its personality changed for the worse. I'm not going to read the rest. I mean, God almighty. I mean, if you've never seen this movie, this thing's full of fucking spoilers. Uh, <laughs> we will spoil it for you. I'm not going to let them spoil it for you. Um, so, yeah, you get the point. And if you're listening to it this far, you've probably already watched it or read the book or watched the new one or whatever. <laughs> or been alive for the last 30 or 40 years. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been out for 30 years. I'm what is 40 the in the cemetery? <laughs> yeah. And why do they spell it wrong? <laughs> and why the God am I listening Damn. to this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Who are these idiots? Emphasis on idiots. God almighty. How high did I get? <laughs> um, all right, so Pet Cemetery, nineteen eighty nine. The movie opens, you have the opening credits, you know. Uh fairly uh it is it, what it is. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, pretty straightforward but, uh, first. Can can I point out like I, I know this is a time thing and I'm sure, you know, all movies look like this back in the day, but I swear to God, the beginning of the, the credits of this looks like a Lifetime movie. I swear to God. <laughs> and to be honest with you, some of the acting in this movie... Uh, I agree. And I agree. between <laughs> between the look of it, you know, it's, and like you said, it's probably just that time frame. Between yeah, the look yeah. of it and some of the acting and what you were saying just now, yeah, I, I totally agree. It's, it is almost like watching a fucking Lifetime movie. <laughs> <laughs> Lifetime presents Pet Cemetery. What was... <laughs> what was Mary Lambert's? Uh, I know she did a lot of music videos, but was she doing that before? Did you say? On, oh, yeah, yeah. She, from oh, what, from what I could, and stuff. It was... from what I could tell you, that's pretty much what she had done. Was uh, you know, up before this music. and after this was mostly music videos. Oh. <laughs> that's something I never actually looked into to figure out why and how she was picked to do to be the director of it. Which... Yeah, I mean, like from what I read, is like basically like th- this this lady was there was uh, I guess Paramount's first choice to direct it. Yeah. She met with Stephen King, 
they hit it off because she liked his books. He's like, I'm, all right, I'm cool with her. And then they went with her. And, that, and it's not it. like she went did a bad job or anything. It's just that no, no, she'd never really no. done anything like this. Yeah. At least as far as I can tell, she might have done one or two, one or two things in movies. But for the most part, it was all music videos and like music documentaries and concerts and stuff. Mm-hmm. But it was pretty high end stuff. It's not like she was doing shit for local indie bands or something. Like this is like Madonna in her prime, you know, in the eighties, and uh, the Go Go's in the eighties, and a handful of others later on. I mean, the well known bands. So it's. It's not like she's cut rate, but yeah, that's pretty much what all she had done. So I'm sure that all, but my, the, the get back to the point is that lends back to the lifetime movie network feel of it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> that in the time period. <laughs> um, so yeah, it starts off with the the opening credits there. And like, uh, the, you kind of see the pet cemetery as the credits are rolling and the creepy music and all that. I thought it was funny too in here. You see a skunk roll through or, <laughs> or run through the graveyard that has nothing to do with anything. Just, Here's a fucking skunk. Um, so, uh, and, and also you hear like epitaphs, epitaphs of uh, graves being read by kids, like in the background of the credits. Like you can hear them. Some of them are, some of them I, uh, I, I recall st- uh, straight from the book too. Like, you know, in the book when they arrive to the pet cemetery and they're looking at them and they're looking at all the, gra- uh, you know, the, the crosses and the gravestones and all that and they're reading them. Um, that's a lot of what you hear here. Like you hear kids reading those in the credits here. So, you know, you, uh, you're, you see the creeds, the family, the family of four arrive at their new home. They've just moved here to Maine. Um, and the little girl, Ellie, uh, she gets out of the car, she runs over and she starts swinging. And, uh, as she's swinging, she sees like a path that goes down through the woods and she points it out. And then the swing breaks and then she starts crying. And, uh, the parents, Lewis and Rachel rush over to her. Uh, to say, oh, you, are you all right? And then they leave the two-year-old Gage just walking. Like, they got him out of the car, and they just leave him walking down the driveway by himself. And he almost gets hit by a, a truck flying down the highway until uh, the the old man across the street, Herman Munster, I mean, uh, Judd Crandall, um, <laughs> grabs judge. him up. And, <laughs> yeah, the judge. <laughs> grabs him up and saves him. And then, you know, that's your introduction to Judd. And uh they asked judd about the path and he you know he's kind of like, yeah we'll check that out I'll, I'll show it to you one of these days kind of thing and and rachel i guess later on that night like uh rachel the mom checks in on the kid and and church the cat is uh uh this is what you're kind of introduced to church i guess you know you've seen him a little bit here and there up to this point but he's sleeping in the bed with ellie and then uh, oh yeah this part i thought was weird like so she looks in on the kids the the cat is sleeping with uh ellie in the bed and then it cuts to Lewis, the dad, outside, and then the cat jumps out of a tree and scares the shit out of him. Like, how did the cat get there so fast? It's like one scene to the next. The cat's <laughs> jumping out of a tree. Um, so yeah, of course you get the uh, the cheap continuity. Uh, <laughs> yeah, continuity is not king here. Um, so, See, king, you get it. <laughs> uh, you also get the uh, generic. Roll credits. Yeah, the end. Thanks for listening. Uh, oh yeah by the way if you go by the old rule of as soon as they said pet cemetery uh the movie's over it would have been early per, it would have been over pretty early yeah <laughs> <laughs> at least in this movie there's no way around it right you know it's not yeah, like yeah. it's yeah. not like uh uh i don't know you know name the other movie wayne's world or something oh, yeah well, yeah. <laughs> well what, one of the movies we watched well, oh, street trash! Fucking little street trash! Yeah. yeah, and that was toward the end of it, right? Yeah, that's towards the end. So you yeah, yeah. you would miss the denouement there, the the whole decapitation by a settling tank. But but you made it through most of the movie. Yeah, I'm sure this is. But a, I swear, I, go ahead. I swear, as soon as they finally uh, started saying pet cemetery, it's just like they couldn't say it enough. It was yeah. like boom, 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 boom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I get it. Come on now. Going back to street trash for a second, you know, when you said like they, they say the word, you know, the phrase street trash toward the end. I like to yeah. think that they had no name for the movie until that line was spoken. Yeah. And then they kind of all kind of look at each other like, that's it. <laughs> Eureka. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, until you get this point we were going to call it tumbling penis. or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were Football going to call penis. it, yeah, we were going to call it Dick, <laughs> Dick touchdown until street trash came along. Street trash is much better. <laughs> is it? <laughs> we were gonna call it junk hole until uh <laughs> yeah, that would have been so much Zing better you know whatever <laughs> <laughs> it probably would have made more sense i guess in the grand scheme of things <laughs> we should call it x-men what 
I don't get it. <laughs> you're not you're not supposed to, man. You're not cool enough. <laughs> All right. Well, um, Whatever, man. So back to Pet Cemetery, you get the cheap uh, uh, horror movie trope, I guess, of the, of a cat or an animal jumping out and scaring the shit out of you. The cheap jump scare. It's intermission. It's intermission. It's intermission. It's intermission. Ice cream, candy, lemonade too, and there's a hot dog waiting for you. About your seat and get yourself a tasty treat down at the snack bar. Snack bar. So yeah, the cat scares him outside, and then uh, then it cuts to Lewis. He's having a beer with Judd, you know, the guy across the road, and they're and they're talking about how dangerous the road is, and and then there's this, you know, and you know, come to think of it, like this makes no no sense at all with the way this movie goes. There's this maid or a housekeeper. Or something, right? Her name's mm-hmm. Missy. And, like, she she yeah. comes to take the laundry off or whatever. And she's given, like, this sad sack story of, like, my stomach hurts. I guess I guess nobody will ever marry me and love me, you know. Well, off to go wash <laughs> your laundry. And then she just leaves. And then a little bit later on in the movie, it shows her, like, hanging herself. Yeah. <laughs> what? Is it this sad? No? Okay. <laughs> But like, what was that? What did that have know, to do that with it? Right? It's not, it's yeah, not like nobody took her and buried her in the pet cemetery. Yeah, there's no payoff here. Like, I'm thinking there. like, well, maybe that, somebody that went and buried her later on, and we get to see her again. No, it's like <laughs> yeah. she's just this sad sack maid who comes along and woe is me, and then hangs herself. The end. <laughs> I, and I don't even. I, I could be wrong, or maybe she, my recollection. Oh, I, I don't know. think it's. I don't yeah, I don't think she's in the book either. So. <laughs> <laughs> maybe she's somebody's sister or aunt and they just wanted to get her a speaking role you know so she can get her sag card or something i don't know i also i want to hang myself too can I, is that okay can we do that can i hang myself yeah that me? works fuck it who cares <laughs> by the way can we do it really bad where you can see the the equipment that we hang myself with <laughs> the, shot? the harness yeah yeah, yeah. The, the, how we should throw it around backwards you can see the harness <laughs> well this is the 80s so you know the, 1985. The, the, 19, the 1985 rule still applies. They haven't got to 1990 yet. Um, by the way, I also want to point out, this is kind of just for us, you know, if not for everybody else, if you've noticed the pattern. Uh, you know, we have never, uh, nine episodes in, we haven't talked about one movie that was made in the 90s yet. <laughs> you shut your dirty mouth. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We've done nothing but like uh, '80s movies. I th- well, one in the '70s, '80s, and then nothing, uh, and then everything else is past 2000. We haven't seen one '90s movie yet, so <laughs> that should tell you what you need to know about the '90s, uh, as far yeah, as yeah, they're a little bit, a little bit few, fewer and far between. So I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, no, they're there, they're all over the place. Yeah. But well, we'll get there, but we just haven't got, <laughs> we just haven't arrived at that destination yet. I just thought I'd point that out. That's right. Um, so then it, uh, sh- uh, there's a scene of Judd, uh, showing that he takes them out to the pet cemetery and shows it to him, you know, since they had already asked about it. Uh, and then, uh, later on, like Ellie at the daughter asks uh, about her cat church and, you know, will church die and all that, you know, the, the, the death theme here, you know, like she's really interested in, uh, knowing about death and all that, you know, as a, as a six or seven, eight year old would, you know. Natural questions. And then and then she says, uh, and then randomly she just says, I don't want Church to get his nuts cut. And they all just kind of laugh, like, ha, 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 that's hilarious. You know, like, even though I don't think they had said anything about, had they even mentioned anything about getting the cat uh, uh, neutered? Up to, until she said that. I can't remember. Maybe they did, but may, and maybe I missed it, but. Just Wasn't not, it that that maid or the housekeeper that we were just talking about was the one that mentioned it to her about? May, hey, yeah, maybe yeah, I believe he makes a comment later about how yeah. uh, thanks for uh, mentioning that to my daughter. Oh yeah, thanks for introducing that word to my yeah, daughter. Yeah, 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 yeah. That was that. that. Yeah. 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 That's right, yeah. So, so that's her function. I, I forgot about all that. So that's why she's in this movie. <laughs> thanks for function. Now you need to die. Yeah. Now go hang yourself. Now go hang yourself, you bitch. <laughs> <laughs> now I introduce cancer. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, she doesn't want church to be depressed and do that. Nope. (laughs) Nope. No, no. I'm going to drive you there. (laughs) I don't want church to get his nuts cut is what she says. And then they kind of laugh about it. And and there's, there's a lot of inappropriate laughter at these kids in this movie. You know, we'll mention that later on. 
kids say the darndest things. I guess, but man, I tell you what, if my kid says this stuff, I'm like, whoa, whoa, take it down a notch there, buddy. <laughs> right, I'm not just going to laugh out. it off. <laughs> Maybe later on, but not right to his face. <laughs> That's funny. Don't say that. <laughs> um, so Lewis, he's uh, you 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 realize that he's like the uh, I guess maybe it, you know it's established at this point a little bit earlier on, but he's like the new doctor down at the local university. So he heads off to his first day of work, and then bam, it's just like it cuts straight to a dude with his head that like half his scalp is gone, being carried into the uh, hospital. Turns out this guy was hit by a car. He's like out jogging, and he gets hit by a car. You know, he's basically he he's not he's not dead right away, but he's pretty much dead on arrival. Doctor can't do anything for him, and he basically dies there on the bed, and Lewis is sitting next to him. And then the guy wakes up and uh, says some random things like, uh, uh, what, like loose soil or uh, something like that. And then he actually says the, oh, doctor, the, the soul of a, soil of a man's heart is stonier. Yeah, something yeah, maybe he says up. that. I can't remember. Something along those lines as he's dying, basically. And then he actually says the doctor's name, and then he just kind of falls back and dies. Um, so that kind of freaks him out, obviously. Um as a would anyone. Yeah. So then you cut to like that night, Lewis is sleeping, and then he has like this uh, dream, and you realize that this guy's name is Victor Pascal. Pa- you know, and they refer to him tons after this, as, 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 just as Pascal. Um, but Lewis is sl- sleeping, and he has a dream where Pascal is like leading him to go to the pet cemetery, and then once they get there, he points to the uh, there's like this uh, barrier of like old dead trees and and, and you know just other rubbish and stuff. And, yeah, yeah, just just a mess of stuff, and it basically, it's like this is a barrier. You don't go past that. Um, I'm, you know, I'm basically, he's giving him a fair warning. Don't go past that. You know, nothing but bad things are going to happen. And uh, you know, this freaks him out. But Lewis wakes up, and then he's like, "Well, you know, it was all just a dream." And then he pulls the covers back, and his feet are muddy. So then I guess he realized that, like, he act that actually wasn't a dream. He he walked out there to the pet cemetery that night with the uh, ghost of Pascal. Um, Rachel, and then it cuts to Rachel and the kids. She's taking the kids to uh, Chicago for Thanksgiving, so they're leaving him there. Um, now a lot of these things are a little bit more fleshed out in the book. You know, like uh, it seems like to me a lot of the things that happen in this movie, it, it's kind of going by the book. You know, like this is something that happens, this is something that happens, and this is something that happens, but they don't give a lot of reasons as to why they happen. You know, they don't dive as deep. They just don't have enough time, I guess, right? Yeah, to, yeah, To yeah. get into details or something. Yeah, so, like, in the in the movie, or in the book, this this is, uh, you realize that, like, uh, Lewis doesn't get along with his father-in-law. So, that's why they just decide to go to Chicago to Thanksgiving without him, because, he, like, he just doesn't want to deal with him, you know, to kind of summarize it a little bit easier. Um, it seems like they could have put a couple lines in there to make you understand that a little bit more. I mean, I think they do, but you know, it's just kind of throwaway. Yeah, a little, very few. But yeah, like you said, more more of that type of lines would have under would have, I guess, led yeah. up to that uh, scene with the you know the funeral where yeah, exactly. they get into yeah. the altercation. You know, yeah, because once again in the book they go and they go into the deep part of it as to why. Like apparently, like when yeah. him and uh, his daughter Rachel were dating, the dad or the the future father in law, whatever, he basically. Pulled out, pulls out a checkbook and says, "Like, hey, I'll write you a check for whatever you want for your uh, your daughter's tuition, you know, to, for college tuition, if you just hit the bricks and never see my daughter again." So at that point, you know, he gets pissed, and then they, and then you know, obviously they eventually get married and have kids. So that's why they don't get along, you know. So yeah, if if, if you'd have had some of that in there, you'd understand that, uh, you know, the, that and the other things that happen a little bit later on, a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, because that scene just comes off as like, wow, he's. They're both very dickish right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he sends them off to Chicago for Thanksgiving, and then so he's back at the house, and then Judd calls him and says, uh, you got some trouble over here. So he comes out, and he's found uh, Church the Cat dead. Um, so then Judge says, uh, or Judd says, I'm going to take you to the uh, burial, you know, the pet cemetery to bury him. But then they end up going past the barrier, like, He's like, you know, he's got the the pick, the pickaxe and the shovel, and Lewis is carrying the dog or the dog, the cat, and uh, they they go over the barrier and then they hike like two or three miles out in the middle of nowhere and it's almost like this, uh, like top of a plateau or something like that. And there's this old Indian burial ground up top. They climb well, up. Literally, after the ghost told him not to go there, he yeah. goes there. <laughs> well, once again, and I'm even a- Judd too. You know, Judd's like. Judd, I don't know why. I mean, I know it's the motivation of the movie and the plot to move the plot along, but Judd knows what's probably going to happen is not going to be good. But he 
does it anyway. You know, yeah, <laughs> it takes him anyway. It, it's a cat, <laughs> not a dog. <laughs> and and in the book they do in the book they also do explain that part a little bit more in terms of like basically like if you've been up there and you've done this, you almost feel like this animal attraction to do it again. Yeah, oh, yeah, I guess it's true. They, I think now now I'm kind of confusing too whether because I don't I don't remember if they mentioned that in the new movie or did they mention that in this movie at all? Yeah, because there's bits of the book that I do remember and a lot of it that I don't because I said it was 1987 or eight or so when I read the book. <laughs> Yeah, and then yeah, and then seeing the seeing both movies, not seeing the original Pet Cemetery for a while before I watched it the other night, and then seeing the new one last night. So, but I, I do, I seem to remember some kind of mention of that, I guess, as far as them being drawn to that location again. But I, like I said, I couldn't remember if that was in yeah, it's this it's, Pet Cemetery. It's, or the new it's one. like I said, it's almost like he knows, like you said, he almost knows this is bad news, but he does it anyways. It, in the book, it explains there's almost like this, you know, weird feeling, like you know, I have to show other people this, you know kind of thing going like you know it's almost like he's compelled to do it you know um but yeah they go there and it's an old they call it the micmac indians it's an old micmac indian burial ground and uh tells them to bury the cat and uh says it's your cat so you have to do it or whatever um i can't help you you have to do it yourself so he he buries him and then you know puts the rocks on like makes a a corn a a corn there or whatever however you say it um so they go back and uh, Judd tells them, yeah, don't what we just did. Don't tell anybody what we just did. You know, don't say anything about it. Um, so event, right after that, Ellie calls, you know, from Chicago and says, how's church? And, yeah, he's fine. <laughs> you know, doesn't want to tell her the truth. Um, I know daddy. Yeah. <laughs> then get, and then uh, they're like, hey, here, Gage wants to say something to you. He's like, hi, daddy. I love you. Hi, daddy. I love you. <laughs> he says it like two or three times, you know. I guess this would be like the two-year-old response, I guess, you know. But Boy, this two-year-old was a stiff actor, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'll also, I'll point out that he says this twice, and then uh, uh, Lewis never says, I love you back. <laughs> and the kid's like, hi, Daddy, I love you. Like, my reaction would be, yeah, I love you too, buddy, you know, whatever. No, he's, yeah. he just, he's just stone cold, like, staring ahead, like, I hate everything and life. <laughs> Um, I just saw death with my own two then, eyes. Yeah, he did just bury the dead cat, so I guess he's just not in the mood to say I love you. I don't know. But, oh, and then so it cuts to Lewis outside. He's still kind of like, you know, in a zombie state, right, from all this. And he's outside raking. And he rakes like ten leaves and then goes in the house. Like, he achieved nothing. Like, he just kind of moves the rake along the ground, scoops up a couple of rakes or uh, leaves, doesn't pick anything up, and then just walks away. <laughs> Well, as someone that's raped before, man, it sucks. Yeah, it does, but uh, <laughs> I guess he's just like, man, I'm doing this, but you know, nobody's here to tell me to do it, so fuck it, I'm not doing this, <laughs> and then just goes in the house. <laughs> um, but of course, you know, after he rakes his uh, eight to ten leaves up and then walks back in, guess who's back? Church the cat, and it scares the shit out of him, of course. But everything works, so it's okay. <laughs> Then he feeds him like some cat food or whatever, and he's trying to talk to him. And then Church scratched the shit out of his face. Then, then it cuts to him like talking to Judd about this, and then Judd tells him about his past with his dog Spot, who had died, you know, back in like 1924 or something like that, and uh, <clears throat> how he how he had buried his dog there. The dog came back to life, but he, you know, he was something was off. He wasn't right. Then uh, he, Lewis asks him, "Has has anybody ever buried a person up there?" And he's like, no, no, what? You know, and then like kind of like stumbles, you know, knocks his beers over and stuff. Knocks like, his beers, yeah. Hey, that's crazy talk. <laughs> we don't, <laughs> you know. Um, so then uh, uh, Lewis, uh, uh, <laughs> cuts to Lewis like getting in a, like in this old like porcelain bathtub that's in every horror movie, you know, the that nobody really has in, the, in a real house, but it's these old porcelain tubs, you know, <laughs> that a grown man can fit in. And so he's sitting there in his... Uh, steaming hot bath as men do and <laughs> and uh he, he puts like a, a a towel over his face and then all of a sudden a bloody rat just gets thrown right into the tub and he looks over and churches over there so but it looks oh, wait, like can I stop you right it there? looks like it's tossed in hold, hold on when, when he grabs the rag to put it on his face yeah he gra- he grabs the rag out of the tub and puts it on his face and it's already wet you mean like where it wasn't in the tub? Right. Yeah, yeah, I think I noticed that too. Like it's over to the <laughs> side. It's not in the tub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, squeeze, and then the squeezes tub. it dry because this is already wet and then puts it on his face. 
continuity again. It's I guess damn, he, pesky I guess he's out of sorts because he's a grown man sitting in a tub. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's that. But how, how did the rag, rag get confused and get wet? Ah, 1985. I don't, um, <laughs> it makes as much sense. So yeah, the cat tosses a rat into the tub, like soft pitch. You know, it <laughs> yeah. soft pitches it into the tub. <laughs> he looks over the Meanwhile, this guy is a doctor who sees the inside of people and he's getting freaked out by a rat. I don't know if I'm if I'm lounging in the tub and somebody throws a bloody rat in the tub, I might you know, I might be Oh god, <laughs> yeah. what the I guess I guess I'm going a couple seconds later when he's out of the tub and he's touching the rat. Yeah, is it, ooh, when he like <laughs> when he barely like steps on it or something like that. <laughs> then he proceeds to the pet pet cemetery with a rat. No. Yeah. <laughs> he had to bring Charlie back. <laughs> um so now the family is back home and ellie asks about church of course you know like instantly and then she finally sees church and then she's like oh she, he stinks church smells bad uh then it cuts to missy the sad sack maid hanging herself and i was i was thinking i was wondering too because like i said i hadn't read the, the book in a while so i was wondering if that was some just loose thread that wasn't tied up in the movie but was in the book but yeah i guess not <laughs> yeah i don't know what that was I mean, I, <laughs> that's a head scratcher, man. Because I don't, like I said, I don't remember that from the book either. So, yeah. um, and look, and if you're listening and uh, you know more about this than we do, feel free to point it out, email us, tweet us, whatever. Help us out with this part because it makes no sense to us. So yeah, then it cuts to the uh, funeral. I don't forgot who the funeral. Oh, it's the funeral for Missy. Okay, where there's a cameo in. Yes, that's oh. that, that's really <laughs> the only thing of note here that happens at this funeral is that the pastor or preacher or whatever you want to call him the clergyman over the funeral is Stephen King himself. So Ellie asks if uh, Missy is in heaven. And, you know, once again, you know, this whole theme of death and you know, how she's kind of hung up on it and asking questions about it and stuff. And Rachel tells Lewis the story of her sister, Zelda, who, uh, who died when she was younger of spinal meningitis. I could be wrong, but I think this is a dude playing her sister. Like, yeah, it was. No, no, I'm yeah. sure you, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But he, he, I didn't know that back then either, but I think I did read something or hear something or interview or something later. Which, yeah, it was a guy. And look, I, and I, think, I, I think shortly after this, she went to go get the trident and uh, face uh, Ganon. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. I guess I went to a game. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I think you're talking about something else. I, th- that part was kind of weird, too. Like, you know, yeah, and that happened in the book as well, but like. Look, I don't know the uh, effects of spinal meningitis, but uh, man, this is she was pretty messed up looking. Like, I mean, is that what that does to you? Like, turns you into, into a ghoul? I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to offend anybody yeah, in the spinal uh, meningitis community, but uh, it seems pretty rough. Yeah, I think it, I guess it twists your body up, but I'm sure they uh, exaggerated it for her. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> for that role, for her, for the look of her. And, you know, this is like one of those flashback, almost like dreamlike type sequences. So, I mean, I, I know they're playing into that a little bit, you know, but. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, she's pretty heinous looking. But, yeah, so she tells the whole story of how her sister died of this. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I searched spinal meningitis and I'm looking through images. And, uh, of course, like about halfway through the page, <laughs> I see Zelda playing. <laughs> <laughs> She's become one of the poster children for me. And then about five pictures later, I see the judge. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad for laughing, but like, why are those two pictures mixed in with all of this? Did you say the judge? Well, yeah. Uh, you mean that old country band, the judge? What are you talking about? I, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm more or less calling the judge for... Uh, my oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that is random. So spinal meningitis <laughs> brings up the Judds. <clears throat> the Zelda thing I get, but <laughs> you know, it's probably people watching this and be like, what the fuck does spinal meningitis look like? And then it comes back to that again. So you're just learning in circles here, you know. Nobody really knows because of this movie. Thanks, Pet Cemetery. <laughs> so then it cuts to uh, the families having a picnic, and you know, the, uh, of course, uh, they're. Their friend Judd is there. <laughs> the Judds. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, man, he, he became really close friends really quickly with that family. Uh, yeah, once again, you know, the book, it explains that a little bit more. You know, like, they they become fast friends, but there are other things that happen to kind of, like, solidify their friendship, you know, that they kind of skip through a little bit in the movie, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, they <laughs> even seem to... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they even seem to skip through even more of it in the new movie. Some like... 
as short as it is, as far as them, you know, befriending Judd and their, their relationship and everything in the old movie, it seemed like it was even shorter than the new one when they got to the point of him, you know, drinking a beer with him and then being in the house and then they're all, you know, buddy buddy and everything. And yeah, yeah. yeah, there was, I do remember that in the book somewhat. I mean, I, mean, I don't remember even the, in, Yeah, even you know, in the book, like, I mean, they, they do become instant friends and they, they drink yeah. beer like instantly, like that night and everything, you know, they become friends. But like other yeah. things happen that kind of solidify that friendship that they just kind of. Right, gloss, yeah. gloss over gloss in the over. movie, you know. Yeah. Same thing for the new movie as well. Now, now, I guess my question is, in the book and in the new movie, do they push Budweiser quite as much as in this one? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't recall seeing a logo beer <laughs> in this movie. And it might be because of the new school of, you know, back then they just didn't. I don't know if they really saw it as advertising. Yeah, I don't, film, think, I don't think they, they did. did. Coke, stuff like that sometimes, and they wouldn't really care about, you know covering it or making it some other generic name or something or <laughs> yeah i mean you watch old um, movies back then some sometimes you'd see a movie that they they went out of their way to cover it up and then other ones yeah you know they, they were be, obviously they'd be just drinking a beer <laughs> can yeah they'd be drinking a beer can that said beer on the side of it you know like mama's family oh, yeah, those kind, yeah. that old show mama's <laughs> family remember they <laughs> you just used to say beer on the side of it but like, yeah they were more conscious of it toothpaste but, it says toothpaste on it. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, this one it definitely felt like they they were getting paid for that because it just straight up like was right in the face, or, like perfectly yeah. framed in the shot. <laughs> well, the budget was eleven and a half million, so there's a good chance that some of that came from uh, Anheuser or uh, Budweiser, whoever the hell makes Budweiser. Um. So yeah, you're uh, so they're at a picnic and they're flying a kite and uh, Lewis is uh, letting Gage fly the kite and um he's kind of doing it by himself and then he accidentally lets go or, you know, slips out of his hand. And then Ellie calls him a numb shit. <laughs> the little girl. <laughs> Which and, everybody finds hilarious. Yeah, that, and once again, <laughs> laughing at like wild inappropriateness <laughs> from the kids. Like the judge just like loses his shit. <laughs> that kid is a numb shit. <laughs> and even the mom's like, ha ha Ellie, you know, like she's laughing. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm probably going to smack her mouth for, you know, calling her two year old brother a numb shit. <laughs> um, but they're well, laughing. As a child, who didn't call their sibling? Yeah, well, maybe. I don't know. I guess I'm the only one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh-huh. Well, you know, there's a pretty big age gap between you and your sister, so maybe, uh, maybe you were more into the uh, phase of cussing. You know, so <laughs> it makes more sense. But like, there's not. It doesn't seem to me in this movie there's a huge age difference between them, right? She's what six or seven, and he's. Yeah. Two or something? Yeah, yeah, About whatever. Four years, you know, three, overanalyzing, <laughs> but still, I thought it was funny. Like she calls him a numb shit, and then they just laugh. Ha ha ha! That's hilarious. Um, so then, uh, of course, like you know, I think Lewis turns back to kind of laugh along with him or whatever. You know, he's kind of talking back at him. Gage runs off by himself, and of course, gets smacked by a truck. By the way, why are you flying a kite so close to the road? If you know you're that close to the road, why are you turning around and leaving your kid alone for? That amount of time. And it's well established between dialogue and foreshadowing that these Orenco trucks fly through going like 80 mile an hour at all hours of the night. So I'm not having to pick Until they kill a that. kid, and then they go really slow. Yeah. <laughs> now, we'll say this about the movie. Like, like leading up to that point in the movie, you really expect the girl to, to, to eat it. Yeah, because that's what I was getting at with the, the death foreshadowing. She keeps asking about death and everything. Yeah. You know, so yeah, you definitely they definitely uh, lead you along. Like, yeah, she's gonna be the one that something happens and walks out on the road and bam, you know. But no, it's uh, it's the little kid, which is pretty harsh, man. You know, once again, oh, yeah. once again, going back to the Stephen King, you know, not even really wanting this novel to get out. You know, this was probably part of it, you know, because it's pretty dour. And then so it cuts to the funeral, and then the father-in-law just comes up and just punches Lewis and basically blames him for letting this happen. Like, you know, I knew if I let you marry my daughter, this would, you know, nothing but ruin will come to you and this would happen, you know. Forget the fact that I let my daughter watch my dying other daughter uh, and <laughs> yeah, let her take care of her. Yeah, my, my <laughs> ghoulish other daughter. Um, that or son, cool. you know, however you want to look at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Considering the casting, you could say either way. Um, so the, he he punches him. He punches Lewis at the funeral for you know saying you know blaming him for this, and then uh, Lewis doesn't really retaliate. You know, basically, he just kind of rolls away. And so then it cuts to, to later on, like uh, he's uh, he's tucking Ellie in to bed, and uh, she says something like, "God could take it back, couldn't he?" Right? You know, like she she does. Obviously, she doesn't want this to have happened, but 
she's praying that God can uh, reverse it, basically. And he's like, no, I don't think that's possible. Um, it's a seed. Yeah. Church is like sitting around. With, it's funny, too, how like church, his eyes glow sometimes and then other times they don't. Obviously, it's just like the lighting and the way they shot it and everything. But the effect is pretty cool when uh, church's eyes were glowing. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah, Lewis f- walks in and he finds church uh, with his glowing eyes and he's laying on top of his wife, Rachel. And then he just says, fuck off, hairball. And uh, <laughs> and then the cat jumps at him, you know, kind of scratching at him again. Um, why wouldn't it? Yeah. He just told me to fuck off. Fuck you. Um, <laughs> I understand English. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> um, so then Judd uh, tells him the story of uh, the, back in the day, someone buried a, a person up there on the burial ground. And uh, it was a guy that had died in, like, World War II or something. And then his dad was uh, distraught and buried him up there. And he came back basic, basically as, like, a mindless zombie and was, you know, uh, mess, you know, messing with people and messing stuff up and uh, coming after his parents and everything. You know, just he wasn't right. He was a, basically a zombie. So they basically mobbed him and uh, burned his house down. And that's where you... the beginning of Dawn of the Dead. Yeah, <laughs> that's how it started. <laughs> this Mic- <laughs> The Micmac Indian Burial Ground. Um. <laughs> And then this, during this conversation is where you hear the line, the, you know, the famous line, kind of the tagline of the movie, um, sometimes dead is better. So, but Judd kind of blames himself and thinks he played a part in Gage's death because, you know, he's the one that took him up there to, uh, you know, bury church and all these things. I guess, you know, kind of like thinking the jinx is on because, you know, this all started with church. So then uh, Lewis sees his family off to Chicago just randomly like, all right, we're, we're getting out, you know, this has happened, so we're getting out of here. So he sends his, uh, his wife and his daughter, uh, Rachel and Ellie, off to Chicago with his uh, his in-laws. And then the father-in-law kind of apologizes for the way he acted and everything. And, you know, they, they see he sees them off. And then he goes, of course, goes straight to uh, Gage's grave. And then he sees Pascal. And Pascal's kind of warning him, like, yeah, don't do what you're thinking about doing here. Because that ground up there, the gr- he says the ground is sour or something like that, you know. Yeah. Um, nothing but... Nothing but bad things will happen, basically. More more warnings. Um, so uh, Ellie in Chicago, she uh, she has a dream about Pascal and uh, of her dad, Lewis, uh, doing bad things. And then uh, right when she's having this, she's telling her mom, Rachel, about this. Rachel then, like, has that recollection. Oh, where have I heard that name? Because she's saying, like, she's saying it weird, like, Paz, Pazow or something like that. And then. Pat Rachel, cow or something like yeah, that. Pat, yeah, yeah. Pat cow. She's saying Pat, it yeah. weird, and then all of a sudden, Rachel remembers, "Oh shit, that guy Victor Pascal, um, you know, that died." So now she knows something weird's going on. She she kind of takes off running, and then uh, cuts back to Lewis. Now he's digging up the grave, and he dug his son up, the little kid sized coffin and everything. And the police almost catch him, and they don't. Yeah, yeah. I like don't that. understand why. I don't even know why the cops would be randomly <laughs> going through the graveyard. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> as he's digging this up they just kind of like scan the light across you know he ducks down they point the right right at a freshly dug grave but don't <laughs> yeah i know they see I mean, they even if you didn't see him I mean, you would you should have seen the mound yeah. of dirt right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, and i, I don't I know if that they was just something that they, they tried to put a little bit of tension in that scene i guess right? I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but then but then like the cop rolls away and then lewis gets this weird <laughs> shit-eating grin on his face like yeah <laughs> I got away with it. God is with me on this one. <laughs> yeah. No, he is not. No, no if it's not God. Uh, <laughs> it's, not. It's, it's the weird Micmac Indian uh, curse. Oh, speaking of that, too, I, and this was something that they I know they don't mention in this movie. There was a mention of it in the new movie, and I can't remember if it was in the book, book but uh, the Wendigo? Yeah. Did they mention anything in the book? Yeah, in the it? book, okay. yeah, there is uh, talk of, like, uh, the uh, the reason that the the ground was sour, according to like the Indian legends, was that uh, there was a Wendigo had got up there and okay. and it uh, I, I, I guess it cursed the grounds or something. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All, yeah. all I think yeah. of is the Wendigo from like uh, the Marvel comics. You know, whenever you say uh, the I, Wendigo, I do remember him from that. Then yeah, that that their character. I think I still have an issue of I can't remember what it might have been Amazing Spider Man that has a Wendigo on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean like that's pretty much all he did was ever he he would swing through and fight Wolverine, the Hulk, or the Thing every once in a while. You know, he's kind of in and out. Yeah, um, I remember the wind. That, that's like uh, I don't remember if it, what if, whether it was Tales from the Dark Side or I'm pretty sure it wasn't Tales from the Crypt, but I remember some older horror anthology TV show. It had something to do with a Wendigo. Yeah. And it was pretty creepy. I remember it being really creepy when I was a kid, and I wish I could find out what that series was. But I think oh, yeah. I did look at all, like, go through all the little synopses of the Tales from the Dark Side. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I mean that is an old one. that is an old like Indian myth or something like that, you know, or, or one yeah. one uh, myth or another about a Wendigo up you know up in the mountains or up north somewhere in Canada or something. Yeah, I don't um, love that whole that folklore of that Wendigo. I even wrote a, there's a short story from I don't remember who the author is now. It's like the 30s or 1940s called the Wendigo, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, about that whole uh, it's very real creepy too. And it's it's all in the woods because it's like a woodland Native American spirit that preys on usually on people that are isolated or somehow get you know lost from their tribe whether they're indians or lost whether they're camping or whatever and then they end up the wendigo drives them insane and turns them to cannibalism yeah all that uh, which is i think some of the scenes that happen in that movie which they don't you know you you almost led to believe that it's like a zombie almost like like you're talking about a dawn of the dead or mirror type zombie yeah thing but it's not really that it's more like that wendigo that they don't really mention in this movie. Mm-hmm. So now you're, uh, Rachel, the wife, is calling. She's trying to call Lewis, you know, because she thinks that something's wrong after this conversation with Ellie. And uh, of course, he's not an- he's not answering the phone. But like then in the background, there's there's this weird painting in in her f- uh, parents' house, the in laws' house, of uh, I guess it's like a boy or a man or something standing there with like a whip, and uh, he's wearing like this little Lord Fauntleroy outfit with a top hat. Oh, yeah. And there's a, a cat that kind of looks like Church, like sitting at his feet. It's in the background there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I when mentioned she's on that, the phone in her parents' house. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like it's a painting in the background when she's there at yeah. her parents' house. I mentioned that because you know that comes back a little bit later. So that's when the cop stopping at the graveyard scene happens. Uh, so he digs Gage up, and then he's just kind of holding, like he he pulls him out of the coffin, and he just sits there and like holding him, rocking him back and forth for a few minutes, and then. Puts him in like this sheet and covers him up. And so then it cuts to Rachel uh, coming home because now you know she knows something wrong is going on. I guess she has this feeling, so she's coming home. She dreams. She has this weird dream about her sister Zelda. Um, and then meanwhile, this is also when the ghost of Pascal is kind of coming along with her and helping her, like helping her get a flight <laughs> and uh, get, helping her get a rental car and all this shit, <laughs> like like planes, trains, and automobiles with Victor Pascal. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I wonder there's an old O.J. Simpson commercial where he was trying to get a rental car. I mean, I'm pretty sure he could have really used the help of Pascal. <laughs> yeah. If only it had Victor Pascal. If and only... that was yet another scene where they didn't care about whether you knew what the company was because it was like a budget rental car. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, uh, Lewis uh, takes Gage to the uh, the old Micmac Indian burial ground. And uh, it's weird, too, like, as he's climbing like this cliff or whatever, he looks down in the water and sees like this weird spirit. Maybe that's yeah. maybe that's something to do with the Wendigo or some I don't know you know like it's it's just it's a cheap ass. But little it comes out, thing. screams at him, and then that's it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I beat you, ghost. Here we go. Uh, okay, it was weird, man, but it didn't kill <laughs> me. So My I guess I'm supposed to do this now. <laughs> My bad, Lewis. My, go ahead. So yeah, this uh, spirit jumps out at him, but he just keeps on trucking. Um. So then it shows Rachel, like, once again, now she's in, like, a rental car, and she's trying to make her way, and then a tire blows randomly, and she wrecks. So it's like everything is trying to keep her from getting there, you know, to help out. Then I, I guess, you know, I, I don't think you actually see it happen, but, you know, he he's he has buried his son Gage up there. Now he's coming home. Uh, and then it cuts back to, like, the, uh, the, the, the corn there on top of the grave. You see Gage's hand pop out of the rocks. So he has come back to life. Um... Then it goes back to Rachel, still trying to make her way home. She gets a ride in this uh, Arenko truck, you know, ironically. And, uh, oh, yeah. That comes down the I'm road. Sure, I'm sure she wouldn't be on some kind of watch list of like, hey, we killed this woman's kid, yeah. so uh, just watch out for this lady. Yeah. <laughs> I guess she's in a desperate state, but also uh, add to that, you know, this this truck company just killed my kid, but yet I'm going to get a ride in it, you know, whatever. <laughs> By the way, I just want to mention, like, the guy that's the truck driver in the scene, he's like, oh, yeah, come on in. Yeah, <laughs> come on in, baby. <laughs> what? Truck driver, what why, why are they stereotyping all that? The truck drivers across the world are like, we're not like that. Yeah. <laughs> they shouldn't. We're, we're not like that. <laughs> 90% of the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, then it uh, cuts to uh, Gage, who's back. He opens up the door uh, of his home. Go, he goes in there, and then he gets a scalpel from a medicine bag. How in the world would he know where to go find the scalpel, and why a scalpel? Right? I mean, it just seems it all seems kind of random to me. Like, how would he know about this medicine bag, and that in that bag is a scalpel, 
And why is that the weapon of choice? But whatever. So then it cuts to Judd, who's uh, been sitting out on the porch. And, like he, I, I forgot to mention, like he was out there. He was going to stop because I guess he had this feeling that uh, uh, Lewis would do this, that he would go get Gage and try to bury him up there. But like he's sitting out on the porch and he basically falls asleep. So Lewis is able to go do this with Gage. So then it cuts to him on the porch. Now he wakes up and he's like, oh, shit. You know, I, I know because he sees a light on the house. So he knows this has probably already happened. But then he hears something in the house and it's Gage. He's kind of searching through the house because he hears him giggling and calling for him and all this. And then uh, why doesn't he run away? Yeah. If I know that this little kid has come back from the dead, I'm not looking around the house for him. I can tell you that I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to burn the house down. I, I'll go live somewhere else. Yeah, I'll go. There was a new house for me across town or in California. I don't know. But I'm done here. Uh, Anywhere away from the pet cemetery that I've been living next to for ever. My, yeah, for my entire 80 year existence. Yeah. Um, Meanwhile, that dog that I buried back here years ago is still living out in the woods for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's a crazed, immortal dog running around in the woods. Um, he wasn't a St. Bernard by chance, no? So he's looking around the house. Yeah, that'd be ironic. <laughs> so he's looking around the house because he hears this, and he knows Gage is in there, and he's even calling out for him. And all of a sudden, Church jumps out and scares him. And then Gage is underneath the bed and cuts Judd's Achilles with uh, that scalpel. So he falls down, and then like he's like, oh, you know, he screams, and then... Gage cuts him across his mouth, like Joker style, like <laughs> broadens his yeah. smile all the way across. And then Why uh, so serious? <laughs> then jumps on top of him and bites his throat out. Judd's dead. Um I also thought it was funny too, it was like this happens, like he bites his throat and then he kinda Gage kinda pulls away and then Judd kinda like, you know, he's dead. And then they cut over to church and he's just almost like nodding in approval, like, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Good job, kid. Thank you. That kid's a baller. Yeah. <laughs> um, a monster after my own heart. Um, so then finally, Rachel, who's been fighting to get home, she uh, finally arrives home. And then Pascal, that's where Pascal's like, this is the end of the line. This isn't the end of the line for you, but it's the end of the line for me. And he just disappears. Which I think this is funny, too, because it's like, it's almost like, you know, she, she. it's not like she can see him or hear him, but, you know, it's almost like a subconscious thing, right? Like, he's kind of influencing yeah. the situation. So, like... Why he has to stand, sit there and deliver this line right before he disappears. Who cares, right? You know, <laughs> I don't care about your story, ghost. Get out of here. No one can hear <laughs> so you anyway. Way you, the viewer, knows that he's gone. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he's like, yeah, I'm getting out of here. So he leaves. <laughs> and then, uh, but as she's standing out in the road, she hears somebody at Judd's house. So she goes over and she goes inside and then, and then she sees her sister, Zelda, just screaming over and over, never get out of bed again. Never get out of bed again. But then it kind of, then she's like, ah, you know, screams. She covers her eyes and she opens it and it's Gage standing there. And he's like, I got something for you, mommy. Now, this is where I go back to that weird painting in the house. He's dressed like that painting. <laughs> he's got like the little Lord Fauntleroy get up on with the top hat and a cane. <laughs> I got something for you, mommy. And then it cuts. Which I don't know. Go back. Say, if that well, was a book thing or not. I mean, I don't know what the little Lord Fauntleroy out burying him I, in that outfit was about but <laughs> yeah i don't know I, i'm I, yeah i i guess it's just the you know the the extremely nice clothes that they buried him in i guess but like it's just weird with the connection of the painting at the parents house right that the kid it looks exactly the same and then and then the cat that's in the painting looks like uh church um obviously it's all on purpose but it, there's that's a weird connection there he's like i got something for you mama and he's got a cane and then he says it again and it cuts back and he's got that scalpel in his hand and then you don't see anything happen, but you hear her scream. Um, then it cuts back to Lewis. Like I guess like the next morning he wakes up, and he's looking around the house, and he sees evidence that Gage has come back. You know, he sees stuff laying around. So he's kind of happy about this. And then the uh, father-in-law calls, like, looking for Rachel because he hasn't heard from her, and he just basically is like, I ain't got time for this right now. hangs up. Um, well, no, no, no. Even right there, he's like, yeah, yeah, she came on. Or, you know, he, he implies that, yeah, yeah I saw her. She, she's fine. She's sleeping. Yeah, yeah. Why would you lie about that? Well, I guess he's just trying to tell him whatever he, the hell he wants to hear so he can get off the phone and go deal with what's going on. I assume, you know, his, his motivation there. But, yeah, so he hangs up and it's like, you know, and then he's about to go uh, run off and figure out what's going on. And then the phone rings again and he picks it up and he's like, damn it, I told you. you know, and then, uh, and then it's Gage on the phone saying, uh, come play with me, Daddy. I've already played with Judd and Mommy. Now I want you to come play with me. 
so come over to Joe's house or something like that. You know, like, oh, shit. Yeah, like, I'm not going over there, you know. <laughs> After you just said what you just said, and I know I buried you, and you came back to life, nope, we done. Um, <laughs> Which was the purpose in the first place. Yeah. Well, I remember, <laughs> he says something like, basically, like, yeah, if he comes back, if he comes back bad, then I'll put him back to sleep. You know, I guess was his mindset, right? So this is why he does it. I guess he figures, like, look, if he's uh, a zombie, I'll just end this real quick. But if he, if there's a possibility he can come back, then I want to try to do it. So that was his motivation behind doing it. He uh, he gets, a, I guess he gets his stuff together, and then he goes over to Judd's house, and he's he's walking up, and then Church walks up, and he uh, feeds Church, a, uh, like he's got like a raw steak, and he throws it out there. And as uh, Church is uh, gnawing on it, he goes up and grabs, the, snatches the cat up by his neck, and then sticks a needle like in his uh, hind leg, and then basically the cat slowly just, you know, he dies. I guess for real this time, he's he's dead. Which he was dead the first time, but you get my point. He's dead again now. So now uh, Lewis goes into Judd's house, and like it's weird. Like the house looks like it's rotten. Like it's there's mold all over the walls, and like shit's falling apart. Uh, it's a pretty good effect. Um, that he's, but then, like, and this is downstairs. Once he goes upstairs, he, like, picks, like, a, up a shoe or something like that. And he looks up, and the house is back to normal again. So then uh, it's, he hears uh, Gage upstairs. He's uh, He's got another needle, like, in his pocket. You know, the same stuff that he uh, popped the cat with. He's carrying it around, and he's and he's looking for uh, Gage because he knows he's in there. And then he, he comes in, and he finds Judd laying dead in the floor. Then he goes back out in the hallway, and then his wife, Rachel, like, falls from the ceiling. And she's hung by... You know, like hanging from a noose or something in the ceiling. And then you see Gage up in like the attic or something laughing. He jumps out and lands on Lewis. And then, uh, he's bite like, uh, Gage is biting him and then he's stabbing and he's stabbing him with the scalpel and cutting him. And I thought this was pretty good editing in this part to like make it look like he's actually wrestling with a two year old kid. You know, there's some clever edits and shots there yeah to make it look like it's actually happening you know so then he he kind of just tosses him off like <laughs> you know basically what a grown man would do to a two-year-old he just tosses him you know <laughs> um which surprisingly you couldn't do it the entire time <laughs> only until he'd stabbed the shit out of him like four or five times could he muster the strength <laughs> to throw a two-year-old across the room <laughs> seems uh, like it would be a vice versa but whatever go ahead. <laughs> okay 1985 um <laughs> So then uh, Gage comes back to Lewis, like, to mess him up. And then Gage, uh, uh, or he comes back. No, he didn't, like, run back at him, but he kind of walks back toward him. And he's saying stuff to him. And then uh, Lewis sticks that uh, needle, that, that the poison needle, into Gage's neck. And then uh, Gage starts crying. And then he says, no fair, and then walks off. And he says it a couple more times. Then he just falls down and dies, which I thought was a pretty fucked up scene. You know, like, to have to do that uh -huh. to your kid. You know what I mean? Like, and it's almost yeah. like there's this moment of like the kid's almost back to normal for a second there, right before he dies. You know, but Lewis didn't think so because he starts pouring gas all over the place, and, <laughs> and apparently on top of his kid too, um, because he then like lights the place up, and then like you know everything starts to catch on fire, and then you see like the trail of gas lead over to the kid, and the kid catches on fire and everything. So he clearly just tossed gas right on top of his uh his dead child. And he burns the house down, but he grabs, he gets Rachel's body out. And then he's carrying Rachel's body, <clears throat> like, you know, out in the yard across the street or whatever. And then Pascal appears again. Like, you know, he's supposed to be gone, but now he's back. And he's like, nope, don't do it. Nothing but evil will come from this. Don't do it. And then he just, he, needs, he basically is ignoring it. And then Pascal just slowly disappears. So he takes Rachel's body. Uh, and clearly he knows the way by now. Yeah, yeah, he's going to take take him up to the pet cemetery, take her up to the pet cemetery, and he and his rationale is like, well, she just died. Gage had been dead for a little while. Maybe I waited too long. So maybe if I bury Rachel, she'll come back. You know, it hasn't been as long. Maybe it'll it'll take this time. It'll work. So he takes her up there and buries her, and then you hear uh, Judd. Judd does like a little voiceover track. You know, uh, Fred Gwynn. Uh, he says a few things, but m most of what it, most of what you take away there is he says the soil of a man's heart is stonier, <clears throat> and then uh, what you buy you own, and what you own always comes home. And then you see Lewis in the kitchen of their house, like sitting there about to play, like he's shuffling the deck and he's about to play solitaire. And then all of a sudden Rachel opens up the door, walks up to him, and then he's like, Rachel, you know you're back. And uh, they grab a hold of each other, and he starts French kissing her. And her, uh, and her fucking eyes like oozing pus out of her face. <laughs> as half of her face is gone. Yeah, as he's Frenching her, 
Then she reaches. And then you find out all along that he was just had a fetish for necrophilia or something. <laughs> yeah. <I> that's <laughs> what this movie's about. Yeah. <laughs> um. So ultimately, the, the 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 moral of this story is <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So help me God. Um. So yeah, they're standing there making. He's making out with his wife's corpse, and uh, she leans over and grabs a knife conveniently placed on the kitchen table she lifts it up like she's about to stab him and then it cuts to black and then you hear him screaming in credits also notice the music in the credits was uh done by the ramones yeah like yes. they, yeah, they that, did a, they did a couple songs song. yeah 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 that's, which is pretty cool yeah that's actually i mean i love the ramones but the classic era in the 70s and stuff the most but for some reason that song i just love it that that, that pet cemetery sorry always has ever since that movie came out i think i had the single on Cassette, as we were talking about yeah. audio cassettes earlier. Ah, the, the beautiful <laughs> audio of cassette. Yes. We all remember it And then on the B-side, it had the other song, the Ramon song that the truck driver was uh, playing before he ran over Gage. The, uh, how, which one was that? Sheena's you a know, punk rocker? song that he was way into? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the Ramon's connection, I know exactly where that came from. That was Stephen King. Cause he's had the Ramon's song lyrics and all that in his books. So I think that and Ramon's and ACDC, I think you'd say, were his what, favorite band? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and, it, <laughs> and I've read a lot of his books, and like there's usually, <clears throat> in a lot of them, there are uh, lyrics to Ramon songs and ACDC songs. Yeah, and there, and of course, ACDC did the uh, soundtrack for uh, Maximum Overdrive. Oh, yeah. You know, the only movie yeah. he ever directed. Yeah, true. Um, which well, which I have a soft spot for that one. Too, oh yeah, no doubt. Even though I me too, it was, it was kind of shit on at the time, but yeah, know, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure our our when we watch that, our ratings won't reflect you know most ratings on that one, but. <laughs> Because I True. love that movie, but yeah. Um, so all right, so that within with that in mind, that was uh, 1989's Pet Cemetery. And what we usually do here, like I said, if you know if you're listening to us for the first time, is we kind of give our you know uh, zero to five star rating on it. You know, nothing fancy, pretty standard. But we give our own take, you know, and how how we feel and recommend recommendations or whatever. So that being said, Will, what, where would you put this one on the old scale? Uh, I'd probably give us a solid three. I mean. The, the acting, uh, again, I would go back and say, isn't the best at all. But but I feel like the story overall just kind of, you know, like kind of salvages some of the, the acting. So mm-hmm. I, I'd give it a solid three. Uh, Smoke, where are you at? Uh, I'm, I'm going with a three and a half for it for this one. And again, that's I saw it initially when it came out. I read the book, but it's been forever, so I didn't really remember. But I remember going to see the movie. It was shortly, not too long after I'd read the book. And I thought they did a good job with what they could do, you know, as far as, I mean, it couldn't be, they couldn't, of course, show anything like you, you just can't with a book. But I thought they touched on everything, and it was very close to it. Uh, again, yeah, if you had the faulty thing, true, some of the acting was a little wooden here and there. Loved uh, Fred Gwynn, you know, his whole thing is Herman Munster, and then him being in that movie, I don't know, there was some kind of, like, a comfort zone there with him in that movie where he, you know, his his dialogue parts and all that stuff, even though he didn't, necessarily sound like Herman Munster you could still hear it yeah uh, and you know, that being a big part of my childhood so there was a lot of uh I guess nostalgia and stuff for starting things when I saw that movie so I give it three and a half um I think I'm gonna <clears throat> I think I'm gonna land uh I think I'm gonna agree with you smoke I think I'm gonna go three and a half stars uh and, and I say that for basically kind of the similar reasons uh Fred Gwynn, Fred Gwynn was awesome in this uh, in this role as Judd Crandall. Um, yeah. One of the things that he'll always be remembered for, for sure, forever and ever. Um, and although, like, I, I think I think my some of my biggest problems, you know, especially after reading the book and you know and enjoying the book as, as I, I have, um, was the guy they got to play Lewis uh, uh, with Dale Medkiff. You know, he he does an all right job. It's not the best, but he's all right. True. I think it's yeah. the, I think it's the uh, the lady that Rachel. Um, what was her name? Denise Crosby, I think it was. Yeah, Denise Crosby. Yeah. I think she kind of mailed it in. I'm sure she's been better in other things, but yeah, and, I, and I'm pretty yeah. sure I have seen her in other things for sure. But she definitely kind of mailed yeah, it in. Didn't gr- seem very into it. Huh? Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> you know, now granted, she didn't have a, a huge part in the way they uh, did. The, I mean, she has a bigger part in the book than she does this movie. You mm-hmm. know that. You know, it's really more about Lewis and and the kids and Judd more than it is about her so much in this mm-hmm. movie. But. Um, because yeah. a lot of times she spends away from them anyways, or from him, you know, from, you know, going to her parents at least twice in the movie, right? When she had gone away. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, there is that. And, 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 you know, once again, that does happen in the book too, but I don't know. It's just, 
Yeah. You know, she has a bigger part, a bigger role to play in the book. And, you know, and I know, you know, you, you try not to dwell on that too much because I know movies can never be a book, right? You know, you can't get into the characters yeah. like you can uh, sure. in a book. But I think, but that being said, in this one, they do stay pretty true to it. Now, granted, you know, Stephen King did the screenplay for a novel that he wrote. So that's probably why they stay so true to the material that they did. Yeah. <clears throat> they only changed a few things here or there, and I can see why they probably changed what they did, you know. So I got no big beef with that. So that that being said, I'm going to go, like, with Smoke, three and a half stars. This is solid. So I think we all, all three of us overall recommend it pretty highly. If you haven't seen it, go check. Yeah. Obviously, at this point, we just spoiled the hell out of it for you. But <laughs> if you haven't, go check it out. We definitely highly recommend it. So on the next show, we will watch, We will come. we will come back to a more current film. And we will watch the movie from 2013, The Green Inferno. This is, uh, did, did you say, Smoke, this was directed by Eli Roth? Yeah, Eli Roth, yeah. Um, have you seen and this his one take on the? Yeah, I've seen it, uh, I saw, actually saw it in the theater. It had a very short run, where I'm at anyways. It had a short run, saw it there, and then uh, on DVD, seen it once more. So I've seen it twice now. Um, and Will, I, I mean, where I, I can speak for myself, I haven't seen it. Will, have you seen it? No. No, so <laughs> absolutely not. What the hell's wrong with you? Um, <laughs> Why are you making me watch this? <laughs> so Smoke's the only one that's seen it. Uh, myself and Will haven't seen it, so you know that'll that'll be a little bit of a pr- fresh perspective. Plus, it's a newer movie, so you know those are always uh, a little more unique to go back and watch. Um, you know than some of the the old standards that everybody likes. You know, you get a fresher opinion on the newer stuff. Um, the IMDB synopsis is brief, but it says a group of student activists travels to the Amazon to save the rainforest and soon discover that they are not alone and that no good deed goes unpunished. So, uh, that will be episode 10 of the all American spook show, the green inferno from 2013 by Eli Roth. Um, so go check that out before the next episode. So, uh, Guys, anything left you wanted to say about uh, Pet Cemetery? Anything else before we uh, put a bow on it? I uh, no, other than watch it. I bought the 4K and uh, watched that recently, and it looks pretty good. The only thing is about 4K is I don't know. I, I don't. I got a 4K TV, and I don't know if you, y'all have 4K TVs. If you actually watch anything with that filter on, mm-hmm. but it, uh, yeah, the one they call the soap opera effect, I guess. Mm-hmm. You ever, you you watch anything in that? No, no, I, I I don't th- no, I don't have a 4K TV myself. Uh, well, I don't know. What is, I don't. I I still haven't gotten used to it. And I don't know that you can turn that filter off though, and you can watch them, and it's a little bit better, I guess, in Blu-ray quality. Mm-hmm. But I, I I buy 4K discs, but I don't watch it in 4K, so I don't know what that's about. But. <laughs> yeah, they actually just re-released that for the 30th anniversary, right, right before this new one yeah. came out. So that's like a uh, yeah. That's a 4K restoration on this, right? Like it's a whole new yeah, yeah. restore from the original print or whatever. So, yeah, I'm sure it looks good. With some new, and I haven't got to watch them yet, but it has the new 30th anniversary uh, featurettes and things on there. So, I've been yeah, yeah. around to watch those. I didn't buy the uh, 4K, but I bought like the regular Blu ray of the same release, you know, the restoration. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I think yeah. it's got a lot of the same stuff on it. So, I definitely wanted to go and check that out when I had time. I just didn't have enough time to watch all that stuff before uh, we did the show today. So, yeah, yeah. It would have been nice to you know have a little bit more of the background on on that stuff, but yeah, it looks like it's chock full of special features and stuff, so that's pretty cool. All right, well, I guess uh, Will, do you have anything to add? You good? No, I'm, I'm all good. Uh, it looks like Green Inferno is on HBO right now. If uh, anybody's listening and wants to watch it before we uh, before we start reviewing it. All right, so there you go. Um, all right, so I guess for myself, for uh, Will, and for the Professor Smoke. We are the All-American Spook Show, and we will see you next time. Later on. Please replace the speaker on its rack when you're ready to leave. Failure to do so will damage both the speaker and your car. We'll be grateful, and so will the patrons who follow you.